Good morning or good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. I'm very pleased to address you today at the opening of this event, which focuses on digital skills training in the framework of our project on ICT competency framework for teachers, harnessing open educational resources. This event is special as it represents the first online interregional capacity building workshop for the contextualization of the ICT competency framework for teachers. Today's event brings together key actors in UNESCO's educational ecosystem, including representatives of ministries responsible for teacher training and for the use of technologies in education, representatives of teacher training and higher education institutions, instructional designers, as well as curriculum developers. Our project is indeed based on an innovative multi-stakeholder engagement that delivers concrete actions. It aims to support member states to contextualize the ICT competency framework for teachers as to meet national and institutional needs through three distinct actions. First action is aligning the framework's components to national objectives related to ICT in education. Second action is about developing teacher training materials based on open educational resources. And third action is about implementing teacher training programs based on these OER materials. I trust that this event will help all of us to deepen this vision, to learn from each other, and to share field-based experiences. Mesdames et Messieurs, come. Ladies and gentlemen, as you are aware, these open educational resources are teaching materials. They are materials for research as well, and they come in many formats. They are in the public domain or uh, they have been published under uh, open licenses. These materials allow free access, reuse and uh, repurposing as well as adaptation and uh, redistribution to other users. In other words, they will be of use to all. In 2019, the member states of UNESCO adopted by consensus the recommendation on open educational resources. This normative instrument, which is UNESCO's first in the area of technology and education, is designed to ensure that the potential of OERs can be made use of to foster quality learning and the sharing of knowledge throughout the world. Today, in the midst of the COVID epidemic, it is clear that digital content has become absolutely vital to ensure that all can continue to learn. COVID-19 has affected over one and a half billion learners in 191 countries. Uh, numerous schools have shut down and nine out of every 10 learners have had to stay home. The pandemic has demonstrated the vital role of learning based on technology, which can serve as the main source of education for those who have access to online learning. At this time, uh, free educational resources, open educational resources have a critical role to play to ensure that uh, learners can continue to learn in their specific situations. And uh, these OERs have shown that they are transformative and contribute to formal and informal learning uh, at a time when technological transformation is speeding up even and including in the field of education. The pandemic has shown that digital skills are not optional. They are mandatory 
uh, and uh, are part and parcel of the professional development of teachers, and they are a teaching toolkit for teachers. impact teaching and learning. This is necessary if we are to lay the foundation for the systematic and sustainable integration of good practices for knowledge sharing and learning support. The global community must act now to make universal access to information and knowledge a reality. Open educational resources are a tremendous asset in this regard and can ensure that we will build back better as we move forward. Our workshop comes at the right time as it provides us with an opportunity to disseminate and implement the ICT competency framework for teachers with a focus on developing OER materials in a wide range of languages. This also materializes our firm commitments to promoting language diversity and multilingualism for more inclusive access to digital resources. This workshop will also aim to provide insights on how this important tool can be properly contextualized, including in Francophone Africa and in Russian speaking countries of the Commonwealth of Independent States. Such societies are those whose members have the skills not only to acquire information, but also to transform it into knowledge and concepts that enable them to take control of their lives and to contribute to the social, economic, and environmental development of their communities. This is our utmost objective, which I hope this workshop will contribute to achieving. I wish every success to this first ever online interregional capacity building workshop. My colleagues and I at UNESCO headquarters in Paris, but also my colleagues in our field offices in Almaty, in Dakar, and beyond, as well as our UNESCO networks, stand ready to support you in taking the learning from this event back to your institutions. We are also ready to further the work of contextualizing the ICT competency framework for teachers by harnessing the potential of OER to expand collaboration and knowledge sharing. I thank you all for your kind attention and I wish, we wish you a fruitful workshop today and a happy holiday season for the next weeks. Thank you, Mr. Jarassi, for this very important intervention. We're very honored to have you here today uh, with us. We know you have a very busy schedule, and it's also the end of the year, so we understand that this is a very exceptional uh, effort that you've made because of the different, uh, different activities going on, and it's through the interest that you've shown to this project, and we're very grateful for this interest. And uh, we hope that you'll be able to follow the debates, which will be very rich. We have uh, today with us colleagues from UNESCO Almaty, UNESCO Cairo, and UNESCO Dakar, and as well as the colleagues from Francophone Africa and CIS uh, countries, as well as from other regions. Um, I thank you again. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you uh, again, Sarah, ADG, so much for taking you. the time. It's so incredibly appreciated, uh, and it shows your support for our OER and CFT work uh, from the highest level, and we really appreciate your time and introduction. Uh, so thank you so much. You're welcome, Sidi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. I just give a shout out also to our colleague from UNESCO Havana who's up at 4 a.m. to participate. So thank, thank you so much. I will change the name because I'm not Mr. Jalassi. <laughs> I'm just saying it. And uh, it has really been a great honor to have Mr. Jalassi with us today. Okay. And I will provide, I would like to speak to you now to provide a overview of what we're going to do in the project 
which will be followed by a presentation by Andrew Muir. And I have to, of course, share my screen. What are we doing here today? First of all, I'd like to welcome you to this event. And it's going to be on the UNESCO ICT CFD Harnessing OER project. And we're going to go through three different uh, points, four different points, basically. First of all, we're going to go over the ICT competency framework for teachers, version three, and then go into an introduction on open educational resources and how they have been used in the implementation and contextualization of this framework. We're going to have uh, case studies of their integration from three different national uh, examples. One from Nigeria, an E9 country that's right now working on the contextualization. One from Rwanda, where we'll see how it's been used in this uh, in developing teacher essentials, and one from Egypt to see how it's been used for teacher training work at the, at a university level. We'll also have online tutorials. So it's a long day, but you'll be very busy. We have a number of two tutorials that will let you get yourself involved with these and, inter and interact with these tools. And we will also have breakout sessions. So what is the ICT competency framework for teachers? There you have it on the screen, that's it. You have, there's a document, it's 60 pages long, but it boils down to this framework. On the left, you have the aspects of what a teacher does in his or her professional uh, work. So the first one is on understanding ICT in education. So we're talking about policy here and how policy in this area interacts with the work of a teacher, the, the professional practice of the teacher. Then you have curriculum and assessment. How is ICT in uh, skills and digital training in implement, incorporated into the curriculum and assessment aspect? pedagogy teaching and how it's uh, actually applied in the teaching. Application of digital skills is really about how to use the different tools that are available and the skills that he or she needs to do this. Organization and administration relates to what a teacher would need to do in order to be able to do the uh, organization for his or her class or uh, courses that he or she is teaching. And professional development, of course, is on how he or she could improve his or her skills. Then vertically, you have three levels of uh, complexity that's involved. So knowledge acquisition, deepening, and creation. Um, its objective is really clearly to see how he or she, the teacher, will be able to integrate the use of digital skills to effectively guide the development of students' digital skills and competencies. What's the point? It's, the it's a document for teacher training. It's not a document for, um, for classroom teaching, it's for teacher training in digital skills. The target are teacher training personnel, educational experts, policymakers, and other providers of professional learning. It can also be used for professional learning of different kinds of uh, uh, systems, for example, for, uh, for youth, youth skills development, or other adult learning, its focus is on digital skills training for professional development of teachers or instructors. So what do, how does it work? Um, you can see two bombs, a blue bomb. One is on policy understanding and you have it, it's the first level of it, as you can see it's here. This is basically defined in the document as uh, teachers make a connection between policy and their and their classroom practice. From there, the teacher competency that should be uh, acquired is to articulate how classroom practices correspond and support to institutional and or national policy. The objective, quite naturally, is to identify how policy implementation is shaping classroom practices. And examples of activities is to discuss institutional national policies and common practices. Teachers can identify and analyze their own classroom practices in terms of how these practices contribute to policy implementation. So this is the framework, uh, an example of how one box in the framework applies to actual classroom goals and examples and competencies. UNESCO, since 2013, has established uh, a hub on the ISCME website, which provides OER that's been developed to support this kind of this training, the contextualization and this training of this 
uh, framework with um, with the with uh, OER that's been developed by its partners. It has had a number of different, uh, we've had about 12 countries and institutions involved from a number of different regions, including Kenya, which was one of the first, one, first uh, ones to work on this. Then we had Djibouti, which is in French at the university level. There's Rwanda that's done extensive work on it. Uh, which is uh, on the ICT Essentials for Teacher Education. The Philippines, which has done work on videos and a lot of different uh, devices, and a number of other ones, as you see on the screen. What does this look like? If we go back to the first example of the policy understanding knowledge acquisition, you have the, uh, the same example, which I just showed you. And on the hub, you have different OER, which are linked to teacher training resources uh, link to this uh, to these objectives. So, for example, for policy understanding, you have a number of speeches, and you have, for example, here a course that's been developed by Rwanda that can be uh, adapted to other contexts. What is the process of this? Um, it is the process that we'll be looking at throughout this uh, this uh, this event today. The first point is to look at national priorities. What are the objectives in terms of digital, digital skills development for teachers at the national level? And then once they are, the priorities have been identified, the development of a curriculum map, which identifies which OER-based materials are necessary in order to contextualize this tool to meet the needs of the, uh, of the, doc, of the national objectives. And from there, from the OER-based materials, the development of a pilot training course, which would test it, scaling up of this course, and also at the same time, sharing of this course in the OER Commons, the site which I just showed you, in order to share the expertise and be able to build this, uh, this knowledge together uh, as a global community. Uh, so this is my official presentation now. Today, we're our, our event, we're going to be having a number of uh, different uh, interventions and in the case studies, which I discussed. And next, I'm going to invite Andrew Moore, who is a consultant at the uh, communication information sector and an expert in this area, who's been working with the project over the years and is instrumental in the development of many of these processes. And he will provide a more in-depth discussion on how the hub has been developed and how the ICT CFT is contextualized as in order to frame our discussions a bit further when we go into the interactive sessions. Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. Um, yes, so um, the idea has been put out there. Um, how do you uh, get up to speed quickly with providing your educators with uh, ICT competencies, um, and this is something that's on everyone's mind at the moment, especially now because of the pandemic, where we've got a lot of schools being disrupted and a lot of children finding that they have to learn remotely. So how do we, how do we do that quickly, cost effectively, and still ensure that there's high level of quality? And so we're going to now unpack what Zainab showed us, and um, I'm going to take you a little bit further down the rabbit hole, but. Um, we also going to encourage you to do a analysis of the various tools that I'm about to show you. Uh, and then you can think, what does this mean for my context, for my institution or for my, for my country, et cetera. So um, what we're trying to suggest then is this is not just a theory or a th theoretical idea, or it's not just a framework, but it also includes a repository of openly licensed resources. Uh, which allow you to adapt them, and also a network of practitioners who are familiar with this, this approach, because they've done it before. And we're going to hear from three of them uh, during the course of the morning to show you that this is a model that works. All right, let me get my notes up on the screen. I'm going to share my screen. Go. All right, so here's a problem statement, which a lot of ministries, a lot of higher education institutions, a lot of schools are beginning to struggle with, uh, especially in the last two years, how do we get teachers to integrate ICT effectively into teaching and learning and into their other administrative duties? 
All right, so what we're going to demonstrate then is that these ICT competencies that we're going to suggest are not only about pedagogy and curriculum and assessment, et cetera, but also about professional development, about managing resources within the school, um, and even having a look at uh, how should teachers respond to policy and national priorities. So it's, uh, it's a little bit more than, than just uh, teaching and learning, although obviously teaching and learning is at the core of these competencies. Um, all right, so we're going to suggest then and demonstrate to you how these three tools are integrated and how they've already been used and how we have a, a network of practitioners who can support you in each of the various different steps. Uh, Zainab had a little flow diagram which she suggested a particular route. So we'll show you how, what that actually means. All right. Uh, so first of all, it's the framework itself. We'll tell you a little bit about it, how it came about, and how it's uh, what its focuses are. Then we have this repository of openly licensed resources. Uh, you've heard about the UNESCO um, uh, declaration on OERs and um, how that's quite close to their heart at the moment, and the member states who all signed up uh, for that initiative. Uh, so we're going to demonstrate it in action and show you how it works. It's all very, it's all sounds fancy, but it really does deliver. So we're going to show you how. And then there's our little WhatsApp group. We have this little team on standby. Um, a number of them are going to present today uh, who have real knowledge and know-how in terms of putting this all together. So those are our three little tools. All right, so first of all, the framework. Now, the framework's been around for a little while. Um, back in 2008, it really was a collection of different bits and pieces, um, um, a framework over here, some suggest suggested routes over here, et cetera, et cetera. It was all a little bit loose. And so in 2011, a team of experts got together and actually built it into a comprehensive document. So um, that was the first real version of the ICT CFD. Uh, you might see it around, it's still very common and it's still being used, even though it's been superseded by another edition. Uh, so if you see that blue one out there, yeah, it's still got a lot of power in it. Okay. However, in 2018, uh, UNESCO, well, a year earlier, there was uh, some research done to find out what exactly is the ICT CFD being used for. And we were amazed at uh, the innovative ways that this framework was being used. Keep in mind, it is a framework. So it's not mandatory in any sense, right? It really is a suggestion about how to go forward. And so we don't anticipate you looking at this framework and going, oh, we'll adopt the whole thing because it's, as you'll see, it's fairly complex and fairly comprehensive, well, it's very comprehensive. So um, the idea then is it is a framework. It's a suggestion about how to go forward and what you should be focusing on. You don't have to have these long debates about what should be in the national uh, ICT competency framework because you can pick and choose from a very comprehensive list um, that's out there. The, the thing though is, ICT and teacher education is fast evolving and the role of technology is, is morphing into a whole load of new areas that we hadn't anticipated. So that's why it was necessary in 2018 when we saw the research and found out what people were doing with it, that it needed to be brought up to, up to date. A whole new a set of technologies uh, had evolved. Uh, mobiles, for example, were hardly an issue back in 2011. They were around, but um, they weren't really seen as teaching tools. Now they're considered essential teaching tools. Uh, the Internet of Things, um, coding, um, uh, and so on and so on. So a whole lot of new concepts and ideas had evolved 2018. And now we're getting some critics saying that even the 2018 one now is looking a little long in the tooth. And uh, maybe we should start thinking about um, upgrading it again. So we'll, we'll see. But for now, we have this uh, document, which we're going to demonstrate to you. Okay. Now, Zainab's already gone through, but I want to just point out that you can see, if you look at the rows, 
these rows are basically uh, specific areas where teachers would be using ICT in their daily operations. All right. So the first row is called understanding ICT in education. And you can see if you look at those three, uh, those three competencies, they're all about getting to grips with the national priorities. What is what does policy say about what role ICT is supposed to be playing in terms of education? And um, there's often a disconnect between the vision of the policy and then what's actually happening on the ground. Admittedly, the policy is supposed to be a directive. It's supposed to be providing a way forward, all right? So it's not meant to mirror exactly what's going on. It's supposed to suggest a way forward. And so that's what that row is about. Um, are teachers aware of their role within national priorities and the role within using ICT and, and empowering the new generation coming through? Uh, the second one is about can they apply these, these directives? Are they able to use technology in meaningful ways? And the third one is shouldn't the teachers be uh, inf influencing the next round of policy revision and reform. Okay, I mean, these are the guys out there cutting edge. They know probably more than the uh, the bureaucrats. Um, so they should also become knowledge creators. So the idea is that they are out there. So that's that first row. The next two, curriculum and assessment and pedagogy are very much about the teaching and learning. So how is it uh, how is technology influencing how we teach and how learners learn, okay? And um, uh, those ones that focus specifically on trying to get teachers. In the first column, the types of styles is really trying to get ICT to support traditional ways of teaching and learning. But as you move into those second and third uh, columns, it's changes. Um, so it's more about using progressive pedagogies, uh, rethinking the curriculum in terms of how is technology supposed to uh, impact positively, et cetera. Um, so yes, it moves from perhaps just being a support tool in the early days, and then it evolves into a much more sophisticated relationship. Um, and much more progressive. So a lot of people are saying, well, we should be using ICTs to uh, effect change. ICTs should be a catalyst in order to transform the way that teachers teach. One of the big criticisms, especially within the, the developing world, is that a lot of the pedagogy is very conservative, very didactic, very teacher-centered, and yet the philosophy about how people learn, and the research about how people learn, has demonstrated that there are better ways to do it, and technology could be a mediator to that end. So that's what those two bands are. Application of digital tools or uh, digital skills is kind of what we traditionally already think of when we're thinking of ICT and education. We tend to think of the vendor tools. So we tend to teach our teachers word processing, how to use a spreadsheet, etc., which has come to us because um, the vendors have always been very keen to market their tools and therefore tend to put the tool first and then we find a way to use it for education. There's no getting around the idea uh, the fact that teachers do need these basic skills, but we're going to move them quickly away from just um, uh, loving the tools for the tool's sake and rather finding how they can be rethought in order to uh, promote good learning and teaching and administrative skills, etc. So again, there's three levels as you move deeper or as you move into the second and the third column. So they become a lot more sophisticated and less about the technology and more about the how they can be used and you can exploit them for your educational advantage. Organization administration. How do we look after our technology how do we ensure that it's secure how do we make sure that it's constant or that it is regularly upgraded that it doesn't just become old and start falling apart um, how do we make start using it for things like emis how do we start using it for school administration uh etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's that band there and finally the teacher professional learning one is how do we start using technology in order to continue lifelong professional development of our educators? How do we 
encourage them to see themselves as learners on this process, uh, on this journey. All right. So um, in the early days, it's about getting some basic skills. But later on, as you move again through those three columns, the teacher becomes much more innovative and um, uh, and so on. So those are the, the bands running across the rows. We call them aspects, educational aspects. So when you hear me say that word, I mean these rows. All right. And by now you've got the idea of the three columns. So the first one is very knowledge acquisition is very much about being aware of these things. Knowledge deepening is really about being able to successfully apply these ideas and uh, uh, um, benefit from the potential uh, strengths of these tools. Knowledge creation is now um, really stepping away from our traditional approaches to, to teaching. And our teachers are becoming creators of knowledge. Our learners are becoming creators of knowledge. We're finding that these, um, tw you often hear people talk about 21st century skills, and they mean things like the ability to be creative and to be analytical and to be able to evaluate and to be cr critical, uh, et cetera. So, um, the, they would fall very much within this third column. So when we, when we hear other people talk of 21st century skills, uh, the framework mentions them generally, but they're unpacked within the framework into specific um, skill sets within that third column, knowledge deepening. And there you have it. So you, when we said it was comprehensive, it really, really is. Although when you look at it like that, there are 18. 18 ICT competencies, which doesn't sound too scary, um, uh, but you can see they're spread over different um, uh, bands and uh, ever increasing sophistication in terms of the skill set. Why we say it's comprehensive then is not so much the 18 competencies, but it's rather all the objectives. So we've broken the, the competencies into finer pieces because if you look at the competency here's the one that Zane spoke very briefly about it at the beginning but let's, let's uh, have a look at this one for example policy understanding a lot of you people out there are policy influences all right and that's partly why you're here you're interested to think well is there a role for this tool or tools uh, in our future so think of that one then that's something that is close to many of you uh, the, the competency is teachers can articulate how their classroom practices correspond to and support institutional and or national policy. All right. And so that is the very first competency of the 18. But if you think about that, that's pretty high level. All right. I mean, if I was a teacher or a, a, um, a teacher trainer, I would say, oh, shucks, that's very high level. How would we know that we've been successful in achieving that particular competency uh, within a teacher? So that's why these objectives are very useful. And you can see that particular competency was broken into two pieces. So if you look in the objectives column, you can now see that we are talking about identify how policy implementation is shaping classroom practice. Okay, that's kind of a obvious one. And then the next one is identify the principles of using ICT in education in a safe and accessible manner. All right, so then you can see now, oh, okay, they're a little bit different. The first one is tends to talk more like pedagogy. And the second one is more about a morality or an ethics involved in using computers for teaching and learning. All right, so again, two different strands. And then the final column provides these education trainers some idea about how they might do that, okay? And you can see there's little suggestions. Again, not mandated. They are purely suggestions and uh, we encourage the, um, the people who are developing training materials that support these the acquisition of these competencies, we uh, have as much flexibility and creativity, and maybe they can come up with something else as well. But anyway, it's a good starting point. So if you look at those objectives, then you can see that first one is broken into two. But when you get into aspect, the uh, one on digital skills, uh, in knowledge uh, acquisition, there are 14 
and you can think of it, and it would be obvious. So the, uh, if you think the competency would say they must be able to use their digital skills effectively, all right, and digital tools effectively. Yeah, but which tools and for what and how and so on. So in that particular one, there are 14 different objectives and people could even argue there should be more. All right, so that's how it works then, this framework. It is quite comprehensive. It provides an array of different suggestions and approaches of how you might do it. And as I, we've been saying, this has been going on since um, it's 2011 when the, the, well, even earlier, but we have been tracking it quite closely since 2011 when there was the, the initial framework. And over that time, a number of different institutions and countries have experimented with how do you do that? How do you use the framework to actually create educator skill sets? And these are, um, I'm going to show you in a minute um, the, uh, how, the, how it evolved. But the nice thing is, uh, the vast majority of these people who experimented with these different ways of doing it um, over time have all been convinced that they should be release their materials with an openly or with an open license, Creative Commons license. And UNESCO has been going around encouraging and cajoling and um, consolidating all of their efforts and putting it, trying to put it all in one place. It, it's it's no, nowhere near. Um, fully comprehensive we keep finding more and more stuff all right but there's a good starting collection within the unesco hub and so the second tool is this repository and uh, on the screen are some of the countries who are involved uh, very quickly guyana was, was one of the granddaddy ones they made a cd-rom back in 2012 with all their goodies on we've mentioned kenya kenya with the first wants to stick it into an lms etc you can see cambridge and coal uh, the University of the Witwatersrand, et cetera, uh, are institutions that have uh, played in this in the sand pit and have donated their materials uh, to to you guys if you want to use it. So uh, the the screen capture on the slide is of the UNESCO hub. So this repository is sitting on OER Commons. And it's all nicely indexed. I will demonstrate it this morning uh, how you can find your stuff. And then you can start thinking about how you might want to align them or adapt them to fit your particular context. And we're going to hear from, from Rwanda, Nigeria, and Egypt about their journeys uh, uh, doing this. All right. So before we, we go any deeper, we need to understand these OERs. So I'm hoping a lot of you are already familiar with these things. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but in case this is something new to you, you need to know what this thing is. So um, basically, OERs are teaching and learning resources. Or well, to be honest, anything to do with education, really. But think of them as teaching and learning resources, which uh, have been released with a license, which allows <coughs> other people to take them <coughs> without asking for permission. <coughs> hey, hey. Quiet. That's my support mechanism down the bottom there, the dog. These are resources that in the main can be adapted. You can take them without asking for permission. There, are, there is no obvious costs involved. There's the cost of your time, etc. but there's no royalties or subscriptions or anything like that. You can just take them. Uh, and the little license allows you to fix them. So you can translate them. You can take out national case studies and put in your own ones. Um, you can chop pieces out that you only want to use a little bit of it, or you could add to it if you feel there's bits missing uh, and so on. You can change the, the technology platform. So if it was on an LMS, you say, no, I want it to be paper-based and you can do that or the other way around uh, and so on. So um, keep that in mind then. This is very, very useful. Um, and this is, allows us to show you the relationship between all these pieces is because the licenses allows you to take them and use them without cost and adapt them for your new context. So you, you might heard that this project is called the contextualization of, of resources for new, for new ideas. The only reason they can work is because of these open licenses. All right, so keep that in mind then if, um, very quickly, 
uh, one of the tutorials has this in, so I won't spend too much time, but Creative Commons is the platform which we use in order to license all of these goodies, which gives us this um, enormous uh, power to uh, change and adapt them. Uh, so unlike full copyright, which means all rights reserved, these ones have some rights reserved, which means we're not giving them away and you're losing them. Uh, you're still the copyright holder, but you have relaxed certain rights. Um, and these are the four rights which um, are used traditionally. Number one is attribution. You can do whatever you like with my resource, but you must attribute me or my institution as the originator, as the source from which uh, your, your course has come from. All right, no derivatives. I'm a developer, so I don't like this one, but no derivatives means you can use my resource, but you can't change it. You have to use it as is. Okay, so I can steer clear of those because why would you share something and then say, oh, but you have to use it exactly as it is. And say, so I want it in French and it's in English. Then you can't translate it because no derivatives are allowed. So I'd steer clear of that one, but it is one of the open licenses, uh, rights which you can reserve. The fourth one down there is non-commercial. That's pretty straightforward. You can do whatever you like with my resource, but you may not sell it at profit or you may not make any money from it. The IP is free and it must stay free, all right? So it's non-commercial. Um, and then um, the share alike simply means that um, I've, you can use my resource and you can do whatever you like with it, but your new version, your, your Nigerian version or your Kenyan version or, or your institutional version must have the same license as the one that I've put on it. So share alike simply means it's kind of a lock. It locks in the, the little license. Um, you can use it, change it, share it, whatever, but you must have the same license on your new version. All right, and uh, then what people do is they, they choose a combination of those four. It's very rare. In fact, it's almost never you'd have all four. In fact, some of them are contradictory. So um, those, the, sec the first column of those little license number plates, license plates, um, show you the most common combinations. So the one at the top there is basically saying you can do whatever you like, but you must attribute where it comes from. And the last one down there says, uh, you must attribute, you may not make profit, and you may not change it. So it's become quite restrictive, that last one. All right. However, most of them tend to be at the top, uh, that you'll see in the hub, tend to be at the top of that list. All right. So there's those different combinations. All right. So keep that in mind. Sorry, I might be on a little bit long. So let's show you the power of OER and the ICT CFT in action. So, and then you'll see kind of the power of this. So we're going to start off with Guyana. That's the first one I really kind of noticed. So uh, Guyana put together a little uh, CD-ROM based one. It was called ICT and Education Teachers Course. It was aimed at in-service and pre-service teachers. It was actually originally a paper-based version, but it didn't stay like that very long. And it became a CD because in those days, CDs were all the rage, all right? Um, and you can see it was mostly uh, knowledge acquisition and knowledge deepening. And there's the little Creative Commons license. So cool, this little CD was doing the rounds. It was being used at both the uh, teacher training college and at the faculty of education at the local university. And they put it together. It still exists and go online and have a look at it. And it's great. Okay. However, the Kenyans then said, oh, 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 this would be nice. We could shortcut the development process if we took most of the ideas here, contextualized it rather for Kenya rather than South America, and um, stuck it on a learner management system like Moodle. All right. So they're one of the first ones who actually put it onto an LMS. And what's more, they said, no, we want a little bit more of knowledge deepening. We've already got an introduction to ICT course for teachers, which is successful. We don't want to replicate that. We want the next, what comes next? So they're focused on knowledge deepening. You can see the license is a little different. And then the uh, Rwandan said, oh, cool, cool, yes. Can we use some of it, please? But we want ours to be more knowledge acquisition. So they added in more things, but they kept it on the LMS. And again, that's available. You can go get it. You can um, adapt it and change it. Then um, in Djibouti, they took the Kenyan materials, they turned it uh, into a university lecturer's course rather than a teacher's course. 
uh, and translated it into French. And the, uh, the University of Lomé grabbed that and fiddled with it more for West Africa, again, still in French though. Um, at, at that point, we realized, oh, we've got all these versions running now. Shouldn't we be putting them in a repository? And so therefore the UNESCO ICT CFT hub, hub repository was set up uh, back in 2016. And so we've been building it for a while now. There's really nice resources in there, but it came to being at that point, and that was our, our attempt to try and consolidate all of these rich resources, but put them somewhere where people could find them. And uh, then the South Africans came to the party, a little um, teacher training, not little, they, they work in Gauteng, uh, uh, which is one of the most populous province in South Africa. They do teacher education and they said, no, we want more knowledge. Uh, we want knowledge deepening, but we also want knowledge creation. So they built 56 units of study of which a good third of them was for knowledge creation. So they're the first ones who started playing around with little courses on how to develop a virtual classroom and, uh, and, and all of those type of things. Um, and so yeah, they're still very powerful, very nice. That was back in 2017. Uh, then the Zimbabweans came to the party. They liked the Rwandan stuff. So they didn't change the Kenyan, they changed the Rwandan stuff. They initially were a paper-based course. Then they found that it wasn't very successful. It's very hard to teach ICT skills with a paper-based course. So then they put it on a phone. It was an Android um, app. And just recently this year, they've put it into um, a program called Rise so that it can now work and it's a much, it's much more interactive and quite cool now. Um, again, um, it works on the phone, works on tablets, uh, really, really nice. Um, okay, uh, that one on the screen there, that was what the app looked like, the Android app. Uh, then Egypt grabbed hold of the Kenya one. We're gonna hear a, little, a lot more about that uh, a little bit later. Uh, they uh, also wanted it to work in a Moodle learner management system, but obviously it had to be in Arabic and it had to make sense for a North African Egyptian context. Uh, and then the Mozambique came to the party. They didn't take anyone else's. They picked and choose bits and pieces from the hub. And obviously there's some Portuguese. Uh, and then Alexo and the Ministry of Education Tunisia came to the party and they created a Arabic language course and the beauty of their one is that they weren't that influenced by the others so it has a completely different structure it has a different approach to how they handle it um, and it's quite refreshing in the sense that it is kind of like a restart a reboot a rethink about how you can teach the competencies it's quite nice and then UNESCO realized that there was um so many national examples now that it was getting quite confusing for people. Where do we start? Which one should we use? Do we really have to do an analysis of all these different countries in order to find out which one we like the most? So last year, um, they put together a, well, it ran into this year, a generic version, which is, I would strongly say is your first point. You should actually have a look at what they've done. They've stripped out any reference to specific countries. They've spoken at a much higher level. So they talk about more about the principles, uh, et cetera, rather than uh, specific application. If you think of it, for example, policy and curriculum are very specific to a context. So here they had to speak at a much higher level. However, um, really nice stuff, very accessible. Again, it's all free uh, and so on. So there's now a generic version, which is also available. The nice thing about the latest one, the generic version is that Moodle, I don't know if you know your learner management systems, but Moodle has a competency-based framework system. So we've loaded in all of the ICT CFD competencies. If you want that, you can just plug it into your Moodle and then you can start linking courses so that people can map their acquisition of the ICT CFT skills. All right, I'm talking too much. So I'm gonna uh, just quickly mention that uh, here's our little network. We'll come back to them uh, after lunch, but these are the people who are involved with all those different countries and others that I didn't mention. There's people from Oman and from Philippines, etc., also involved. Uh, Etc. So uh, we'll talk about them, but they are really those three components come together to form this little model. 
You've got a very detailed framework. You've got a repository of rich, open educational resources. And you have this little group of practitioners who are experienced and they know how to do it. All right, so that's the, the model, the three pieces that interlink to create the model. Um, all right, we uh, see our, uh, our agenda goes a bit different from how I designed it. So now we're going to hand over to Chris and Francis, who are going to give us an insight as to what does this actually mean at a national level? Chris and Francis are working uh, in Nigeria. They've got a little ICT CFD project. They are preparing a, um, a, a, some training course for the teachers. They're going to explain uh, their thinking and how the framework was utilized. All right, I'll stop there for now. Well, uh, mainly to thank Andrew for his uh, detailed and comprehensive presentation. Uh, I found it uh, very rich, uh, certainly uh, very stimulating and inspiring being myself or having been myself for 35 years, university professor. So I can put myself in the shoes of a teacher and I can think of how this could benefit uh, the learners. So thank you for that. I like in particular your map and uh, the evolutionary uh, aspect over time, how you started with the Guyana and then you ended with the Tunisia and Alexo. I think that's um, and the, the many countries uh, across regions that have started using the open educational resources and the competency framework for teachers. So, so that's great. This is what UNESCO is about, serving member states and making impact on the ground. So well done, congratulations, and uh, best wishes to all. And I'm sure that everybody will keep up the good work going forward. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Mr. Zavassi, and it's a great honor having you here. Thank you. We're very honored today to have both of you here. Um, the first case study will be on uh, will be on Nigeria, which is the country where we have been working the um, where, where we have been working on uh, the latest, one of the countries, the latest countries. And it's a very important country. It's an E9 country, one of the most populous countries in the world and a very, uh, very interesting country. And with that, I leave the floor to Chris. Chris. Chris Mayaki is the secret, Deputy Secretary General of the National Universities Commission. And this yeah. is a very important body in uh, Nigeria, as it is the body which is the sort of the chapeau, the, the over umbrella organization that oversees the incredible number of universities, which Chris will tell you how many universities it is. It's more than some places have people. Um, so I will give the floor to Chris. Will be followed okay. by Professor Francis, who is um, who is okay. the uh, a lecturer and director of distance learning at in Nigeria. Please. All right, thank you very much, uh, uh, Zainab. Uh, all right, so let me bring the warm felicitations of uh, the Honorable Minister of Education, uh, the Executive Secretary, National Universities Commission, and the two, uh, you know. Uh, Steering groups, the, both the advisory and the technical, and the warm felicitations of uh, uh, Nigeria um, uh, to uh, the participants of this uh, UNESCO ICT CFT Interregional Capacity Development uh, Conference. Um, Nigeria, I'd like to quickly say that Nigeria aligns itself uh, totally with the aims and objectives of the Interregional Capacity Development uh, Conference. Uh, you will also recall that uh, since uh, Nigeria, uh, since Nigeria participated in the first Africa uh, regional consultative meeting in Mauritius, where our dear Zainab was, and then which was followed by the second OEL uh, Congress in Slovenia, Nigeria formally uh, embraced as a matter of national policy, uh, you know, uh, and uh, decided as a country to uh you know uh, benefit from the potentials the utilitarian values uh to be, to be derived uh, from the oer uh subsequent to that we constituted a national uh steering uh, committee which produced the first ever national uh, oer policy which was well received 
and uh, uh, validated by all the stakeholders. And we presented this at, uh, you know, in uh, Ljubljana in Slovenia. Uh, subsequent to this, uh, Nigeria, uh, with the uh, full support of UNESCO, both in Paris and uh, in Dakar, was to, uh, you know, host the first ever maiden Nigeria UNESCO, uh, you know, workshop uh, on the CFT ICT in March 2021. And uh, I'm pleased to inform that uh, we have, uh, following all this buildup, uh, submitted our first narrative report. And we have uh, also, as recommended, con con constituted the two national working groups of eminent persons to drive the implementation of the project in Nigeria. Uh, this is including the curriculum mapping, which uh, my friend and brother and colleague, Professor Igbo Hare, will uh, uh, have the opportunity to give you the details and the nitty gritty. So uh, there's a question as to why is uh, uh, this uh, CFTI city so important to Nigeria? And I don't think we will be able to uh, capture the real essence of why uh, Nigeria is moving in this direction if we don't, uh, you know, familiarize with ourselves with some basic uh, statistics and facts about Nigeria. Nigeria, as uh, Zainab alluded to, is the fastest growing higher education system in the world. I mean, in, in, Af in sub-Saharan Africa, sorry, with uh, 201 universities, uh, a couple of hundred polytechnics and colleges of education, Nigeria currently has a 2 million enrollment in the university system. Uh, and uh, every year we have, uh, uh, you know, 2.1 uh, million kids wanting to go to university, but the entire 201 universities put together can only accommodate and admit 750,000 uh, students. And uh, we have about uh, 75,000 uh, teaching staff uh, on whose behalf we're making a case for the CFT and uh, competencies. And then we have about 165,000 non-teaching uh, staff. Um, yeah, so some basic uh, facts about Nigeria. And of course, you know that Nigeria will uh, is projected to surpass the United States of America as the third uh, most populous country in, in the world by the year 2050. And so why OER, why are we keen in, why are we buying in, why is this? Uh, become part of our 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 uh, priorities now is because we believe that uh, this resource, you know, this uh, opportunity resonates with our national priorities and educational policy as a government, uh, which is consistent with the agenda 2030 uh, of the UN, uh, which uh, seeks inclusive and qualitative uh, education. Uh, we also believe that. Uh, when we finally put in place this system, we will derive the maximum benefit, you know, to broaden access and equity to education and those learning, the, the much needed uh, learning resources in a very cost effective uh, and affordable manner, as uh, Andrew uh, alluded to. We also uh, believe that uh, the, 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 the CFT ICT uh, resource will reverse the poor ICT penetration uh, to be found in our educational. Uh, deliver on, on our educational uh, system, and uh, uh, you know, and and I think, and we, as we all agree, the pandemic has also made a compelling case, you know, for qualitative uh, blended learning and digital delivery, you know, based on the new realities that have been imposed on uh, on the academic and administrative uh, uh, cultures in our educational institutions, and finally. Uh, the ultimate beneficiaries will be the teachers. And we hope that under this uh, project, you know, we will improve the capacity, uh, you know, and the pedagogical skills of our educational providers or teachers as, 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 it, as, uh, as it is. Uh, and uh, finally, I'd like to uh, express the deep sense of gratitude that we feel for uh, UNESCO, uh, Zainab and her, uh, you know, uh, formidable team, uh, the champions that are all participating in this, uh, you know, uh, event and all the other stakeholders, uh, you know, for, for, for giving us this opportunity. And uh, we are eagerly looking forward to the outcome of this uh, workshop because we believe that we will be able to glean the best practices, share where we are, the position where we are, and we hope that we can advance and accelerate our ongoing project. And it is now my uh, distinct honor and privilege, as I already asked,
to be excused because I'm embarking on a journey to, uh, you know, yield the floor to uh, one of Nigeria's uh, shining lights, uh, one of our reputable academics, uh, the former president of the Nigerian Academy of Letters, uh, Professor Igbo Hare, who himself is an expert, uh, to move into the nitty gritty and having given you the overview. Once again, I wish us a very fruitful, uh, uh, you know, event. And uh, I thank you once again, and the best of the Yuletide season and a much better 2022 to all our colleagues and champions around the world and the Nigerian team. I thank you once again for the opportunity. I want to thank you for uh, this opportunity to um, make a, a, a very, very short uh, uh, contribution. Um, I, I need to thank uh, Andrew Moore, first of all, who more or less guided us uh, through the uh, procedures of a lot of what uh, he has pre presented today. We have had to, to hear, to listen to him twice or three times and then uh, benefited from uh, uh, his uh, wisdom and expertise. I think it's also necessary for us to thank other African countries uh, whose resources we are building on because we are not starting from the scratch. And uh, I think the, this kind of uh, uh, accumulated wisdom uh, from different uh, uh, institutions uh, is what is the way to go uh, because the substantial cost of uh, uh, higher education in Africa is the cost of uh, uh, learning resources and uh, skills development. Um, what we have done basically is, uh, if I may just uh, add to what uh, Chris has presented, uh, is uh, that uh, there has been a number of meetings uh, uh, that, have, uh, that were pre prelude to uh, the uh, March 3rd meeting where there was stakeholders consultation uh, that led to a number of decisions that were taken uh, because Nigeria is a complex country and uh, part of the decisions was to ensure that all stakeholders are uh, mobilized and uh, we are all on the same page. I can say uh, quite conclusively that that is what is happening now, that uh, there is a lot of enthusiasm uh, on the ground and uh, eagerness uh, for us to move on with uh, our development. Critically, uh, I need to get to the real uh, uh, crux, the, 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 so, uh, the, the, the expected outcomes that have been presented by uh, 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 Andrew. Uh, and I, I, I need to say, for instance, that uh, we, the maiden workshop that was done had a number of uh, 60 stakeholders, that's on the March workshop. And then of course, uh, with all those who are involved in the higher education session, uh, session, uh, uh, sector in, in Nigeria. Now the key out outcomes of the workshop, um, part of which uh, uh, Chris has talked about, is that we need to adapt and contextualize the ICT CFT version. And that we are doing very well. Uh, but a number of issues have arisen, uh, is what do we do with the uh, the issues like the delivery modes, uh, how do we ensure there is equity? How do we ensure that there is a, uh, we, we, we are building from bottom up uh, so that the stakeholders are part of uh, uh, forming, uh, determining exactly what the needs are. Uh, and, and of course, uh, a lot of that we have succeeded in uh, uh, transcending that situation. And so where we are basically now is the, development of the adaptation of the resources themselves. Uh, there are many issues that we have had to, uh, to deal with under the guidance of uh, Andrew. Uh, one of them was uh, how do we sequence the 18, um, 18 units? Uh, and uh, we, we've been able to sequence the 18 units on the basis of the characteristics of our country, on the basis of what we perceive uh, from the straight stakeholders as the needs. And, uh, and uh, we also have been able to determine that the delivery modes will be more flexible. Uh, we we'll use both the mobile learning platforms and then progressively uh, move into the Moodle platforms with all the different uh, complexities. So what we basically have done is to say that we'll build up from the simple, uh, create a, a system also that, ha that, that recognizes prior learning. Uh, and then of course, uh, so that individuals who are already inserted uh, uh, who already have the uh, skills and the competencies in, uh, that are listed in the unit uh, don't need to enter from the bottom. But we also said that we, we have to determine exactly what the, prior, what the skills level are before, in the, before the teachers themselves are, 
allowed to get involved and engage with the uh, with the process. So, um, so the the, the we, we, we formed uh, the the technical team has uh, formed the collaborating teams uh, and assigned a, a given assignment to uh, different institutions and uh, dif different stakeholders, regulatory agencies, as opposed to to be part of those teams. For instance, I have been given an assignment with the University of Ibadan. And yesterday, I was able to add the University of Illori uh, to my group. University of Covenant University has also joined. Babcock University has joined my group. Foot Mina has also joined my group. Uh, that's the so-called Ibadan group. And the idea basically is to ensure that ownership of the, uh, the resources at the end of the day will not be uh, restricted to one or two universities because there are universities in Nigeria are often in competition. And, we want to be able to list uh, as many of institutions as possible, uh, colleges of education as possible, as many polytechnics as possible, as part of those who have contributed to the development of these uh, uh, resources. So basically, I need to mention that uh, um, the, we also went from there to look at timelines and uh, expected outcomes. Um, for instance, the, 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 we, on the 30th of 11, we took substantial, uh, 30th of November, we took substantial decisions. Each institution is to provide names of local experts by 12th of uh, December, which I believe has, has been done because I have done that for my group. Uh, then Andrew, for instance, is to give us a template uh, of proposed structure and after our discussions, for instance, we, we want to be able to map the kinds of adaptation that we want to do. Uh, where we need to have case studies, we insert the case studies. So we, we don't just want any, the groups to go into it blindly. We want the maps to, uh, every resource to be mapped in such a way that what will change, how it will change, and what we need to do is collectively done in, unis, in unison. Then the structure and format of the resource, again, also we uh, be agreed on. And that in itself, we have agreed on the, on the procedure. So I think what, what we just need now is uh, just having a, a collation of documentation, and so we can mo move on from there. Then, of course, the, uh, the other issue that I think is uh, critical at this point in time is that we have been able to put the technical expertise together, because we also observe that there are individuals who have the uh, theoretical know-how, but may not be able to implement uh, the technical changes that we, we need to happen to the documents. Uh, and so that, for instance, we've uh, taken care of that. Uh, even brought in people from the private uh, sector who have the capacity and so on. Um, so uh, where we are also now is to look at, take decisions about which server, uh, how uh, giving access, for instance, to those who are going to be implementing the OERO uh, uh, adaptation, access to servers and where the, where the resources will be located for them to be able to do, to do that. Um, and once, uh, the access codes have been given, I think by, by the end of March next year, uh, by the end of March next year, our timeline is that we are going to uh, be able to come up with a draft which will be submitted for critiquing uh, by all stakeholders. And then uh, we, after that, we will then uh, uh, be able to add the Nigeria imprint uh, to the uh, global uh, resource uh, base that we have uh, uh, today. Um, I want to thank you, and uh, if there are any other questions that will need my, uh, uh, my uh, answers from me or explanations, I'll be glad to take them. I'm sorry that uh, I am in a kind of in a ho hotel environment, so I'm going to have to, can't speak for too long. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francis. Um, so what you're seeing from Chris and Francis is that the level I was speaking at, then there's another level this contextualization needs to be taken seriously. So even though there's all these lovely resources available, they're gonna to have to be reworked. And you've got to kind of work within your environment. Francis pointed out that ideally they want as many universities as possible <clears throat> to embrace this model. And yet the reality is that most of them see themselves in competition. Yeah. So how do you broker that relationship as well? Um, and we could see from Chris's discussion with the numbers we're talking about here are enormous, potentially enormous. So how do you get around that problem as well? So these are all things that the Nigerians are working on, chewing on, sharing, discussing, etc., as they contextualize these materials um, so that they work for their context. 
guys, thank you very much. That that's it's nice to show that there's this other level. Okay. Um, um Andrew, Bennett, you want to comment? Yeah. Yes. Uh, perhaps you'll have some reactions very soon because we're going to be asking you to do some stuff. So I will give the floor to Andrew. Andrew, please. You have the floor. Cool. Okay. So the problem with these Zoom meetings is that um, half of you don't have your cams on. We don't even know if you're really there. And to be honest, I can talk till the cows come home, but you won't get a real feeling for it until you start thinking about, so what does this mean for my institution and my context? So therefore we've put together a little interactive tutorial for you to work on. I'm gonna put a clock up on the screen in a minute. So for 20, 20 minutes, I want you to go through the tutorial, um, play the videos, look at the thought pieces. Um, we want you to actually look at the framework. So both, both Zainab and I put a couple of screenshots up on the slides, but look at it yourself. See what else is in that document and to what extent it might be useful to you. So in the chat, I'm going to put in the links. We've got this tutorial is available in English, French, and Russian. And um, we must thank our teams who have helped translate it uh, from the English into those other languages. Um, if you do pick up anything weird, then let us know because we're hoping there's a life for these tutorials after this conference. Uh, we can always uh, fix them up and, and reuse them. All right, I, oh, we see we do have a question on the screen. Uh, so before we break away to have a look at those uh, tutorials, I see we've got one hand up. Uh, Hasoub, uh, would you like to address us? Thank you very kindly uh, for your information about these uh, OERs. I'm Abderrahim. So I have a doctorate in uh, teaching, and uh, I work on measuring outcomes, educational outcomes uh, in Morocco at the Ministry of Education. I'm also the national representative of Alexo on uh, OERs. I would simply like to report back to you on the uh, experience we've acquired in Morocco. We tried to introduce this uh, concept of OERs and uh, uh, work them into our national education program 2015-2030. We tried to introduce this concept uh, during the uh, reworking of the primary school curriculum. Well, how did we proceed? Every year, the ministry rewrites the curriculum uh, for primary schools, and uh, we provide OERs to suit these uh, rewritten curricula in order to encourage teachers to produce new activities to uh, add to the resources that can be used in the classroom. Since 2018, we've organized contests in order to support these teachers in uh, their work of producing OERs that are standardized and that are in line with the ministry's guidelines that uh, look to the values of our policy. We have held three sessions with the minister where we've uh, worked to develop these resources and we've uh, put uh, the results on our platform. And uh, we have taken out the uh, Creative Commons license to cover it. This is the third year of the program. And uh, next year, we will uh, hold another round. and. The idea, these are not mobile apps. We have produced filmed training kits, videos with exercises 
These are designed for middle school and high school teachers, and next year we'll take this even further and um, train teachers in producing their own materials. It is our hope, and this is something I work on uh, every hour of the day, we uh, work remotely, uh, Alexo has different components, and uh, Alexo has been very supportive in helping us disseminate this concept in Arabic-speaking countries. And we now have a platform that's been provided by Alexo, which makes it possible to share our resources, our OERs. It is my hope, my dearest wish, that uh, as soon as possible, a workshop can be held here in Morocco to uh, further raise awareness of the value of these OERs. And uh, we are available to support, to guide users in uh, harnessing the power of uh, these resources to uh, allow them to um, perform their teaching work, whether remotely or in presence and uh, physical presence. And uh, we need all sorts of materials, uh, uh, materials of varied nature to enrich our storehouse. Uh, I sincerely thank UNESCO uh, for all of this, their support, for extending access to their resources. And uh, we feel deeply honored to uh, have won the 2017 UNESCO prize and we work very closely to uh, uh, keep abreast of the latest developments and uh, work with the other members of the network. Thank you, dear Zainab. Thank you, dear participants. And we do hope to see you very soon at a workshop dedicated to our educational system to take this work further. Thank you very kindly for your attention. Thank you. Excellent. Thank so you very much, much. sir. Um, right. Let me. Uh, I was listening on the uh, on the translation. That sounds very exciting. And as you can see, there is a community. So um, Morocco now is is uh, part of our community. Alexo and in North Africa, it goes across the world and we're encouraging you guys to become part of this network too. However, a lot of chatting, a lot of high level discussion, let's get under the bonnet of this beast. All right, so on the screen at the moment is a question that I would like you to answer uh, in a moment. So we're gonna give you some space to work through the tutorial the links of which are in the chat. So can you go to the chat and click on the one that interests you, English, French, or Russian, and um, spend 20 minutes working through the various materials. When you are, when we call you back, we are going to want you to answer the question that's on the screen. So the question is, in your context, which ICT competencies should be the focus of a national or if you're representing an institution, institutional ICT CFT and subsequent course or courses. So we saw, we heard from the Nigerians that they spent quite a long time worrying about that question. So many people in their country, so many people are requiring, uh, so many teachers requiring these skills. And yet we've got to start somewhere. So they had to identify where they believed the, the national priorities should be, the, what, what skills they should have. So I'm going to ask you that same question for your country or your institution in 20 minutes. Can you look through the doc document, download it? They're all available in all the different languages on the tutorial. Grab the one of, that interests you. Spend 20 minutes. All right, so um, we've had 20 minutes. To be honest, there's no way you can do it real justice in 20 minutes. So uh, I appreciate you're a bit short on time, but I would, um, you, by now you've got a gut feeling. Where do you think your 
institution or your country is in terms of priorities? Should you be working in the knowledge acquisition area? Should you be working knowledge deepening? Maybe it's knowledge creation, and maybe it's a specific band, one of those aspects. Maybe it's not all of them. Maybe you say, oh, to be honest, we so desperately need pedagogy, we would put most of our eggs in that basket. Admittedly, it's up to your context, it's up to your how much resources you've got available. But what we're trying to argue is that a lot of these things already exist as openly, edu uh, openly licensed materials. They exist as OERs, and um, therefore you could make a, um, a, 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 an attempt at a lot more perhaps than you would normally do because there is this uh, much lower barrier to entry. All right, there was, my numbers are slowly climbing. Keep, keep typing, just give us an idea. I mean, it's, we just want to get a feel from your perspectives. Now that you've had a look at this document properly, not just listening to someone else go on about it, but you've had to think, where are you at the moment? All right, the one that caught my eye is this one, um, uh, Kazakhstan. Uh, the picture is different at the institutional level in classrooms. Teachers need skills from a pedag pedagogical, I can never say that word, teaching and learning perspective in using ICTs for learning, problem solving, application, and integration of digital skills on the way to their transformation, as most to have basic knowledge. So the, uh, th these are the types of things you've got to start considering. You don't want to replicate something that already exists. Maybe there's been a number of years where you've been already working on the, some of the basic ICT skills. And now you want to say, all right, we're, we're moving up the chain a little bit, as, as, is, as is discussed here. And remember, I mentioned that was in Kenya. They had the same thing uh, where they said, no, we went round two or round three. Uh, the South Africans, remember, they wanted to go even maybe a little bit higher up in terms of offering different types of continuing professional development. So yes, and you heard Chris and you heard Francis agonizing over their selection of where they're going to start in terms of choosing some competencies uh, with that particular Nigerian context, which is big and scary because there's so many people. All right, what else have we got? Let's have a look if we've got one or two others I can just highlight. <laughs> I'm gonna have to cheat. In this day and age, you can kind of get away with murder. Let's have a look. At least I'll get the gist. All right, so um, our French colleague here is saying that uh, wanting to work in the knowledge deepening. Remember, that was more about application uh, and specifically for their institution. So they're not thinking nationally, nation, nation wise, but specifically um, uh, their institution. Uh, we have distance education platforms with some content. So obviously, the, um, I think the suggestion here is that they want to supplement and expand and grow, which because they're OERs, you can do. You can chop and change and cut and paste and refashion. Um, so that's interesting. So thank you. All right. Um, there's a few more coming in. I think there's a couple of English ones. I can work out later who it's, uh, who it's from, but uh, for now it's quite fine. Knowledge acquisition and perhaps a bit of knowledge deepening. This is because there is a wide range of competency ITC skill gaps in my country among teachers. This would allow the majority to be carried along. And yeah, that's something you're gonna to have to decide. Are you aiming at the majority or is there a specific subset that you want to, to support and take to the next level? Um, and yeah. I'm afraid these are the types of decisions and reflections and, and needs analysis that will be required when you're beginning to take this first step about what are you going to offer. All right, I think we're getting the idea. And you can see that um, there's been quite a number of different approaches. And it looks like the finer your focus, so whatever your lens is, 
uh, the more accurate you can be in determining which of these competencies you want to offer in a first um, first iteration. Guys, thank you very much. Um, we tried to get away from just chatter chatter and presentations. We wanted to give you something to do. I'm very encouraged by some of these um, these feedbacks that um, uh, you're beginning to see uh, the. The, the, the power of the framework um, the fact that it's so comprehensive can initially be a little bit daunting, but as you begin to unpack it, then it begins to make more sense. And once you begin to contextualize how it will manifest itself, even more sense. All right. So thank you very much. We had a, uh, we've had our little interactive session. We're running horribly behind time. Well, uh, actually, we're not. We're almost perfect. I tell you what, rather than us going to breakout rooms now, let's just open the floor for another um, 10 minutes or so before we have our break, uh, rather than uh, go away and have little discussions. Um, can you, uh, in the, the, the main screen, can you put up your hand if you have an observation or a comment or a, a, a critique about what you've seen? Um, let's let's kind of open it up a little bit so we can hear you. It's one thing to read what you say, but what are what's on your what are your initial reactions to this first piece about the framework? I see Sergey's got his hand up. I uh, see what he's done. He's gone to his reactions and he's chosen to put his hand up. If you have a comment or an observation you'd like to make, can you do that, please? So we can go in order. Sergey, over to you. You're first. I'm going to speak Russian if that's all right. My colleague has a few words to say as well in a moment. She works on uh, working out new standards for education in Kyrgyzstan. She's quite uh, pleased with the materials. She will have something to add later. I'm going to put up a few pieces of information for you on the screen just to illustrate the work that we've been doing. So we have, um, based on this uh, ICT CFT competency framework for teachers, we have uh, developed uh, our own competency requirements for the teachers uh, this year. And uh, across uh, all three levels, starting from the uh, level of acquisition uh, to the level of uh, understanding and level of creating knowledge um, and um, across uh, six domains, we have uh, developed uh, our uh, ICT competency uh, for requirements for teachers. So the basic information actually is available on the website, uh, which uh, Sergey is sharing now. And um, I also wanted to specify that uh, these uh, 18 ICT competency uh, requirements, uh, they are actually in the line with the priorities, the, with the national priorities of Kyrgyzstan, uh, of Kyrgyzstan government and the Ministry of Education and Science and the other um, uh, subordinate bodies, uh, which were participating in our task force uh, group. Um, representing different stakeholders, education stakeholders mostly. Uh, so there we have um, identified that these ICT competencies, they are uh, very well aligned with the national priorities, as I mentioned before, and also national um, documents and concepts uh, like um, the concept on dig digital transformation of Kyrgyzstan, uh, uh, law on education, uh, our state educational standard and um, qualification requirements for the teachers or the requirements um, regulating the teacher status. Uh, so it was uh, actually a very interesting exercise for Kyrgyzstani stakeholders, I think. And I think that um, our teachers, they are nowadays at the uh, different levels of um, uh, mastering ICT skills starting from the basic skills, digital skills. So let's say like connecting computers and uh, printers and um, making simple presentations uh, and finishing uh, by uh, creating uh, video lessons um, on their own. Uh, and also, um, we also, I also would like to stress here that we, uh, we included uh, media and information literacy skills 
as a special component um, within the, across the across the domains of ICT safety. So, the uh, like um, like uh, like uh, this. Um, I think um, uh, first three domains like understanding ICT curriculum and assessment and pedagogy, they have been developed before 2020. And uh, with the pandemic and with the situation which was uh, rolled out uh, during pandemic of the COVID-19, uh, our uh, education stakeholders understood the necessity of um, developing further uh, the ICT framework for teachers by including the other levels of uh, other domains by including application of digital skills, uh, organization and administration and teacher professional development. So all six domains are already included. And based on it, uh, based on the approved ICT competency standards for teachers, we have already developed the uh, teacher pre-service and in-service teacher training programs. So they have been developed, but uh, we are in the process, uh, and I think it will be the next stage of the project development when we will train trainers, and then uh, trainers will roll out this program throughout the country. Thank you. Thank you. In Kazakhstan, the situation is a little bit different. We have some special projects. Um, because we didn't have um, any any specific programs for um, ICT competences. We didn't receive the documents uh, that we needed. Because you were talking about the hub with uh, resources, which would be very interesting, I think, for other countries. It would be good to see how national politics, uh, how national policies are being used, and we could perhaps use them as an example to base our work on. The current policies in Kazakhstan and laws in this area are very specific to our national context, and they don't always meet international standards. So, what we'd like to do is take these international standards into account and find how we can do that. Perhaps you could help us with that in some way. Now, we've been developing remote education a great deal in Kazakhstan in the COVID context, and we've developed um, more and more uh, skills in this area, and we need to continue doing so. Thank you. Great, yes. So to the two speakers, uh, Izan, would love to put your stuff in the hub. Um, it's. Uh, there will be a demand for that. Thank you very much. Um, and then for Sergey, yes, they, we, we kind of know where these policies are. They get dated quite quickly. But if you want a couple of examples, we can dig them out for you. So yeah, that sounds good. Uh, all right, Barbie, your hand is up. Do you, would you like to address us? Thank you. Greetings to everyone. I would like to uh, say a quick word. I'd like to thank those who issued an invitation to me. I'm Francis Barbet. I'm a specialist in media education, and I've been involved in a project uh, on a master's for education in media that was uh, run in Paris at uh, Paris 3, and I uh, gave that course for several years in a row. And there was much material developed at the time, and uh, this made it possible to establish in Paris an observatory on uh, public policy in media education, particularly for Western Africa, to take stock of uh, existing materials. We also integrate um, education on the media in our curricula. The seminar makes it possible to understand the dimension of uh, information and communication technology role uh, not just from the standpoint of uh, critical analysis of them, but uh, from the standpoint of training teachers in these skills. And uh, this has been very inspiring to me. Uh, the work I've done with my colleagues at Pi3 has been informed by this material, and we've, we are working to foster some initiatives in Western Africa. Some initiatives uh, are already underway here and there, and there's much to learn from them. I work to create a program 
at the Abidjan Catholic University. It's a, a bachelor's program, and the idea is to see how the ICTs can be used in education and allow teachers to uh, acquire skills in these technologies. So I'm really just taking the floor to thank you, to thank UNESCO, and to say that I have been listening with great interest and taking notes. And I'm sure that after this seminar, there is much that we will be able to do here in Paris and elsewhere. We who work on education in the use of media and education through the media. Thank you once again for holding this seminar. All right, thank you very much. Um, um, all right, so I'm gonna give you now um, a little break because you've been sitting here uh, working and listening and debating, etc. Uh, okay, everyone, welcome back. Um, uh, this afternoon session, we're going to look at the hub and at the network and also start to uh, see if you guys are interested in collaborating in any way uh, with an ICT CFT project. All right, so if we have a look at the agenda for this afternoon, it's changed just slightly. We're going to just start off with Vincent's presentation. Uh, remember, we we're talking about different um, contexts where people have to grapple with real world problems in order to adapt the ICT CFT. So Vincent's going to give us the Rwandan perspective to give a general introduction to Vincent. So um, one of the countries which really took the ICT and shook it was uh, Rwanda and particularly the Rwandan Education Board. Uh, Vincent is works in the ICT. Uh, department and they've got to come up with te technological solutions in order to improve both teacher education but also just education in general so his department looks at um, different technologies and different methods in order to improve uh, education generally um, the they've had a couple of goes at adapting the ICT CFT for teacher education um, they did an ICT essentials course a few years back and tried it out uh, with a number of primary and secondary school teachers. Uh, it was a facilitated course. They had um, the materials on a learner management system, the REB's Moodle server, and then they trained various um, ICT experts to be the facilitators for the course. And then the teachers did like a blended learning. Uh, first of all, they did um, a face-to-face -face workshop for a day or two, and then the rest of it was done online. Um, so they've had, they really got their hands dirty in terms of uh, taking the framework, adapting it, um, contextualizing it, and then using it as teacher training materials using the, uh, the new technologies. And then the second go uh, attempt at it is they've, they came up with their own advanced ICT essentials course, which took some of the uh, more sophisticated competencies in the framework. And then they started to look for ways to um, create those type of courses. Thank you, um, Andrew and the UNESCO team. Thank you for inviting me to share the, our case study on Rwanda journey on contextualization of ICT competence framework for teachers. So basically, um, this was in line with the Rwanda ICT in education policy. And uh, our policy was very clear uh, uh, enough to uh, the policy. Actually, it, it had like three objectives. One was to promote science and technology in education with, but focusing on, on ICT. The other one was transforming Rwandan citizen into skilled human capital for social economic development by ensuring uh, equitable access to quality education. Um, so this was after the, um, the 1994 genocide where the, there was nothing. The, so the country was shattered. So there was like nothing uh, really uh, in terms of the quality of education. So we we decided to adopt the ICT uh, to move faster the country. So uh, this was also um, uh, when we, we developed the, the national curriculum, it was also very clear that uh, 
ICT was to be used as a tool to enhance teaching and learning at all levels. So um, we in 20, actually in 2014, we, we had developed uh, a teacher training program. And uh, this teacher training program, it was um, um, designed to, to, uh, to capacitate the teachers on how to use ICT. Uh, because uh, we didn't have the framework and uh, we didn't actually have the information about the framework. So it was until um, UNESCO uh, uh, region office for East Africa, that was in Nairobi. So when Yako uh, attended the meeting here in Kigali, so we, we had a chance to chat with Yako and the team and they were they had an interest um, on our training program so that's how actually the journey started um, because we we had a training program but it was not aligned to uh, unesco ict cft and uh, we wanted also our teachers to gain more of the skills to use ict in teacher training so uh actually after Meeting the UNESCO team, um, we we had uh, like um, to set up the task force. So we needed to set out the task force uh, because we we had the training program, uh, but we didn't have the capacity to uh, how we can and align our training program uh, to UNESCO uh, ICT CFT. So uh, we we we. We, we requested the UNESCO action. So in terms of um, um, training and also in terms of uh, that contextualization process, uh, as well as um, uh, training the, the, the Ministry of Education uh, and, and its affiliated agencies on how to, to use the framework. So uh, it was then that, um, uh, we sat down as a team and uh, we agreed, uh, we looked at the ICT in education policy and also we looked at, um, because the CFT, uh, one of the, uh, the, the objective was to align um, CFT uh, into our training program, but also it was to support uh, the development of the ICT in education policy because by then it was still in a draft. So um, the, then we outlined the development process because we, we had to, uh, to do it much faster because uh, what we were using was not actually on the standards. So the team uh, composed of the UNESCO and the, the Ministry of Education and its uh, affiliated agencies, we sat down and um, we looked at uh, our training program and then uh, we were uh, we were having like uh, if we have this unit uh, what kind of the competences do, do we need to have for our teachers to uh, to to have so that's when we 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 selected the competences from the UNESCO ICT CFT uh, 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 framework so that was uh, the version two of the UNESCO ICT competence framework for teachers. And then we also, because we had developed some training materials, other training materials to, to use during the training. So um, we had to look at those materials and also other open educational resources. So there was a suggestion that uh, there were available open education resources so we started actually a process of selecting uh, those uh, opening license materials that can be integrated into our ICT in education um, um, policy, but also at the ICT essentials. So this was actually a basic course that, uh, that looked at the area focuses on technology literacy of the growth phase of the knowledge acquisition. So we looked at the the open license materials after identifying those open license materials. And then we, we had to sit down and um, uh, 
uh, and uh, look at how they correspond to uh, our national curriculum because we the the good thing about the, the the framework it is very easy and adaptable so you can you can adapt uh, based on your context so we looked at our, uh, our context and um, we say that uh, um, because it is very easy to get um, the competences from the from the framework and then integrate it into your uh, own context so that's what we were doing at the first year during the the, the workshop so we, we we had the framework and uh, we would get uh, the competences that we think that is matching to our context to our national curriculum framework and then uh, integrate it into uh, our training program so this is how we actually we we manage to to have a program um, uh, that really um, suits first of all the needs of the 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 the, the our training program but also looking at how the teachers will integrate uh, the, 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 the skills necessary for them to integrate ICT in teaching and learning. So actually um, uh, from that meeting, uh, it, it was decided that um, the course should be um, piloted because after the development, we had to go through the process of the uh, validation and uh, after validation and then we had to train the uh, the the, uh, the the teachers who were going to train the other teachers so uh, and uh, by then we didn't have a mass of the teachers who were really um, have these capacities to train others so what the UNESCO did um, we we train what we call the e-tutors so because the course itself was a blended, so it has a part of the face-to-face -face and also the part of the online. So we trained, we first trained the, the e-tutors and these e-tutors were based at each district. So we, 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 we invited them for a workshop. We had a workshop of six days and we trained them. So after the training, uh, then they went back to their respective schools. Then um, they started training. So um, uh, the first pilot, actually, we 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 decided to pilot the, the course into um, uh, uh, around uh, ten to twenty schools. So we had ten to twenty schools because we wanted to see the effectiveness of the course after the the, the, the development, and uh, actually uh, it had an impact in those schools. So there was. Um, a request from the teachers that actually we should pilot this course in more schools so after that short pilot then we collected the data after the correcting the data we had to uh, to develop the m and e framework on how we are going to to do monitoring uh, of the trained teachers uh, after the training so we actually uh, I can say that the, 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 the first um, development of ICT centers for teachers in Rwanda, uh, we, 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 we tried also to, to look at, to benchmark to other countries that had um, actually completed their training program. For example, we looked at the Kenyan ones uh, because uh, this, um, they had already developed their uh, ICT centers. Uh, the Kenya CFT. Uh, so uh, I remember uh, uh, Andrew was looking at um, how we, we had done our ICT essentials and uh, he tried to help us to, to make it look uh, a bit more of interactive. So from there, we, we decided that um, uh, the course should also be at the hub, at the UNESCO hub. Uh, uh, so um, I'm sure that um, people who have visited the hub have seen the Rwandan uh, ICT essentials course. Uh, this course, uh, by then, uh, uh, we decided that 
uh, from onwards because we are training using the uh, ICT essentials for those teachers that were entering into in service uh, program. Uh, and then the course was adapted by the ministry. And even uh, if anyone wants to start training, of course, they had to look at the, the content that we have developed. So today, uh, the course has been um, uh, piloted. I can say that the, the stage of piloted has, uh, has completed uh, like in three years. Now the course is, was integrated into our training program. So far, what I can say uh, on the part of the ICT essentials, uh, right now we have close to 11,000 primary teachers who have undergone through, through ICT essentials. And uh, uh, we have also another project that came in to support uh, the project for World Bank, uh, which is um, supporting um, uh, uh, the primary teachers in Rwanda to develop the digital skills. So the World Bank decided also to use the ICT essentials, uh, the course which was aligned to UNESCO ICT C CFT. It's now being piloted into even uh, in other schools. Right now, we have around 11,000 teachers who have completed uh, this course. And um, after the training, because we, we have other institutions that, um, um, uh, that satisfied the teachers, so we use the ICDL for those that are for, uh, entering into the um, uh, entry level for, of the teaching, uh, so they need to pass through this level. So um, from this point, um, after the piloting, uh, then we, we, we had also to look at uh, how the teachers can really acquire more depth skills uh, on using the ICT uh, essentials for teachers. So uh, it is, again, the idea came that we should look at the more advanced one, target the advanced one, because um, we, we had, done the pilot and the results of the pilot was really uh, promising and uh, we saw that there was a need from the teachers the need from the the e-tutors who were training other teachers so we we really had to sit again and look at uh, what what should be uh, in advanced level so uh, because I, uh, I was asked how we 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 came out to into this contextualization. So we, we, we decided by when we are developing the, the, the advanced ICT essentials for teachers. So we looked at all the feedback that we, we received from the previous course. So we looked at the participants uh, and what, what really the participants wanted. So, and again, we had to sit down as a team uh, I remember the UNESCO was also a big support in the uh, formulation of the, uh, the advanced ICT essentials uh, because uh, uh, the, one of the participants that really helped us um, can say the Andrew was part of this process um, from the formulation of the course uh, to the, until to the validation of the course so um, uh, the similar, actually, we, we took the similar development trajectory, uh, like the ones that we used in the, in the, in the ICT essentials. So um, uh, it was also decided uh, through um, uh, the workshop that uh, the, the same model should be used. And uh, because in the first ICT essentials, we had uh, around 14 units of study, so the, the second one was not supposed to be, uh, we needed to have it short, but we look at those competences uh, that really um, um, the, uh, also are the, the competences that would really um, uh, emphasize on how the application of the ICT. So um, I saw the Andrew was explaining on the UNESCO um, uh, CFT version three. So I, I'm not going to talk about how um, we use the UNESCO ICT CFT version three, but it was really very important 
because um, when we were developing the advanced ICT essentials, uh, UNESCO safety competences uh, were adopted. Uh, so we looked at the competences that can be integrated into our advanced ICT essentials. So of course, we looked at also some of the suggested um, OERs that were really available at the hub. So we looked at um, different OERs that uh, are free. So we integrated them into our um, uh, advanced ICT essentials uh, for teachers. Uh, again, um, uh, so how did we come to, uh, to selection uh, those competences and also how was the consensus like um, gained among the participants? So uh, of course, we looked at the, the recommendation from the, the first, ICT, CS, uh, ICT essentials for teachers course. Again, we looked at, uh, like, as I said, we, we had, we had developed different institutions, uh, the Ministry of Education, the University of Rwanda College of Education, uh, College of uh, Technology. So we had in, involved different institutions like um, other development partners, so who were involved also, we get a, a feedback from them. So, and it was also the consensus was that uh, the course should focus on knowledge deepening and knowledge creation um, of the levels of, of the UNESCO um, uh, uh, CFT. So we looked at those three um, levels, um, knowledge deepening, knowledge creation, uh, and also try to, to see how um, the open education resources, uh, which are available on the hub, uh, how it can be included and enhance our training program. So there was also um, uh, uh, an agreement that um, we should try to include some, some of the multimedia elements so to enhance the, the, how the course looks uh, and some video materials um, from, 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 the, from the original version of the ICT essentials for teachers, uh, because this was also a request from the teachers who were the, um, the beneficiaries uh, for, of the uh, course content. Uh, so after that, we, we after agreeing what needs to be included in the in the advanced ICT essentials, then the next stage was to the development process. So in the development process, this is where we had to identify uh, uh, the, the course modules. What 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 modules are we going to uh, to to select? Uh, and also we looked at the the scope and um, the time uh, it is going how big it is. So we looked at the, uh, the, 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 the scope of the, the content. We looked at what activities that we will need to, to, uh, to include. And then, of course, uh, we decided that we are going to use this development team. So we had also to identify the development team. So um, mostly the development teams were from the teacher training colleges and um, uh, from the ministry, uh, from different uh, uh, departments of the curriculum because it involved some of the materials. So uh, it went through different uh, development process uh, because at certain point we needed even to write some scripting. So uh, this was uh, a, a, a act actually uh, a big part of, of the course because we, 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 under, we followed all the process for course development. Uh, it was not easy, but um, because we had worked with uh, UNESCO in the original um, development of ICT essentials. So there are some also capacity building of the ministry staff to, uh, to design and also uh, to know the process for, for the development of the course. So we, we had some, um, some um, 
capacities that were received from the people that we worked with from the UNESCO, uh, because the UNESCO uh, use, uh, provided a, a expertise in the development of this program, and also uh, not only the expertise, but also the funding. So um, the course uh, uh, was then developed. So after development, um, so we had to, uh, to develop also, you know, when the course is done, you're done with the development, then we need to, to validate the course. So we invited different uh, participants, uh, different uh, organization to come and uh, validate our uh, training program. So um, the course was validated. So this advanced level uh, actually is yet to be, uh, is yet to be uploaded on the hub. So we, 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 we are looking uh, because we had added some of the materials um, uh, from the this program. So um, we hope that very soon we will be able to upload um, this training program, the Advanced ICT Essentials for Teachers course, to the hub. So we'll have two actually two program on the hub. So one is for I, the the basic the entry level. The other one is for the advanced. So we'll have these two both of the two concepts on the hub. So that's what we are, we are hoping to, to have also the course on the hub. So um, uh, if, you, if, if you look at the, uh, the, the, the slide 12, um, the slide 12, so you have uh, the UNESCO ICT competence framework. So in the knowledge acquisition and the, in the knowledge deepening. So, uh, this is how we, 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 we actually we are trying to contextualize uh, the, the, the framework into our own um, um, our own training program. For example, in the in the training we are we are we we are having, so we are giving the framework. So we print out the framework uh, to the teachers, and then um, so they determine how they are going to use it in their uh, and their syllabus. For example, they they come in the training while having their syllabuses. Uh, so, if you look at the in the knowledge acquisition, we have uh, in the curriculum and assessment we we have the basic knowledge. So, we are using different um, uh, uh, different models like the the uh, the uh, the IO. So we try to tell them to identify which areas uh, they that can suit into their the syllabus. So for example, so in the determining ICT for enhancing teaching, so we let them identify uh, which in their syllabus, which activities actually can integrate uh, the ICT tool for effective teaching. So, uh, you can see from the uh, 12, uh, slide 12, we have identify, decide, discover, and then develop. So we let them discover which tools that really uh, that they uh, correspond to what to the section of their syllabus. So this is what we are doing during the training, and then after uh, after that, they will, they will decide or they will the they select the most appropriate one because we have so many tools. Um, it's the same thing. We have different uh, open education resources which are there, but it's very critical to know which ones really suit um, your your needs uh, or your training needs. So uh, this is uh, one part. So, so where we we bring them. Sorry, Vincent. Them, can them. You come up yes. And start summing up. All right. So um, in summing up, so uh th there is a lot you can use in the framework so um uh the framework is actually very easy and uh, it has uh it has guided uh for example in our training program it has guided us in so many ways so we can play around we can change so we can we can go even on the hub and try to look at the what others have done so in our training program uh um uh, I'll share. Uh, I've, uh, I'll share very soon um, uh, on with the team uh, because I've developed a kind of training manual. 
So uh, using the framework. So it's, it's something new that I've, I've really created. And uh, I believe it can help the teachers how uh, we have contextualized into our own context. So I came up with a, a, a very good uh, training manual so that can really help. So I hope maybe uh, I'll be able to, to, uh, to share with others um, on the hub, um, uh, the UNESCO uh, on the hub and the others, maybe they can see also if uh, they can maybe get something out of it. So uh, the, uh, 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 slide 14 is just a sample uh, on how actually we, we develop our training uh, program because it has to reflect our framework. So the framework uh, is structured like this. So where we have the topic, we have the unit title, and then we have the competences. Uh, this, the key competences actually, it is drawn from the UNESCO ICT safety, as you can see. It is there, and then we come up with the, the learning objectives, the knowledge, understanding, skills, attitudes, uh, because in our framework also we need to, uh, to capture the, uh, the attitudes and the values for the teachers. So they, there are some kind of attitudes and values the teachers they need to develop while they are, they are using ICT. So uh, uh, basically this is how we, we have been, um, uh, the journey of contextualization of UNESCO ICT CFT into our training program. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. All right, you can see from Vincent's uh, presentation um, very much about the nitty gritty of taking it from a concept and actually make, turning it into a proper course which has real impact uh, within the Rwanda context. So a lot of thought, a lot of effort, and um, you can, uh, I'm going to show you now where to find those resources if you want to review them and maybe adapt them. And uh, Vincent, I'm going to hold you to the advanced ICT essentials materials. We want those on the hub ASAP, please. That would be great. Yes. All right. I'm going to push. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you very much. I'm going to push on with the program. Um, right. So where are all these things that we keep going on about? And so I'm now going to demonstrate this hub that Vincent mentioned on numerous occasions. So where is it? I've put a link in the chat so you can click on that and actually go through and have a look. I'm going to put it on the screen as well so that you can you can see. The UNESCO ICT CFD hub is actually sitting on OER Commons. So some of you who are familiar with open educational resources will already be familiar with this particular repository. And um, UNESCO has got a little hub on the side. It uses the, it uses the power of the metadata in the background in order to, to organize all of the ICT CFT resources. But yeah, there's the link. Yeah, oelcommons.org hubs UNESCO, and then you come into here. So um, I'm gonna ask you to do a little tutorial. Uh, we're running out of time fast, so I might actually, um, uh, not give you very long for that, but basically it's our little community page as well. So yes, it's a repository, but it also offers lots of other bits and pieces as well. This first piece here, you've got a little propaganda movie about how wonderful the ICT CFT is, and it is, it's great, all right, uh, in French and in Arabic. And if you want to know a little bit more and see what it looks like in Rwanda, etc., there's a little movie there as well about um, how the REB and the ministry, uh, what their view was on this ICT essentials uh, uh, project. All right, so we've got that as well. However, if you are scrambling around looking for resources, this is the piece which is very powerful. So if you look at it vaguely, it looks like that grid that we were looking at earlier with the aspects down the sides or the rows. And then the columns are those three levels of ever increasing complexity. And uh, one of our speakers earlier, was it Kazakhstan? I'm trying to remember, mentioned that they're trying to cover everything. All right. And yet we've heard other people say, oh, no, 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 we want to do, focus on a specific area. So this really then is the 18 competencies. And you can see then what we have resources for. So that first one that I demonstrated this morning, the policy uh, understanding, we've got 18 different units of study. When it says resources, that's doing it a disservice, 
all right? They're not a worksheet or a video, all right? They are actually units of study, all right? So the whole idea then is um, someone's thought about it, someone's prepared the learning pathway, someone has collected the resources, someone has designed the activities, uh, and so on. So it's not just a resource, it's a course. It's some, we'll put it like this, it really is a unit of study. And that makes it much easier to adapt because then you can see the logic that flows through all the pieces. Should you say, all right, so I'm looking for something on policy understanding. You can see if I click on there and go through, it'll demonstrate the 18 resources which are linked to that particular competency. Some of them are from um, uh, uh, various bigwigs uh, um, promoting or uh, justifying their involvement, but here are the actual units as well. So you can see this one here is on policy. Uh, that's the Rwanda one that we've just heard about. This one is from Zimbabwe. Uh, this is what that Guyana course that we looked at earlier. Here's the generic one that was mentioned also earlier. Uh, here is the Kenyan one, etc. And you can keep going. Oh, this is from, this is the Lome uh, from Togo. So um, yeah, they're here. Then you can come in and have a pick. So for example, if we look at Vincent's one that he's just presented now, this is the one that's on policy. Um, because it's in OEL Commons, it's all nicely organized and it is uh, linked to metadata to help people find it, etc. So this is still inside OEL Commons and it's giving us the metadata. Here is the standard. In this case, it's one of the ICT uh, compet uh, CFT competencies. Um, and you can see here is a little description what it's about. You can see here's the Rwanda Education Board. They are the copyright holders, but you can see it's a fantastically open license. All right, CC by USA. If you know your Creative Commons license, you're going, yay, I can more or less do what I like with this one. So this gives you, uh, it explains that it's in English and that it's mostly text and HTML. So let's go and have a look at it. So if you click on view resource, It'll just say, we're going to leave OER Commons, is that okay? You say yes, and now it's taken us to the server where this particular um, unit of study is available. So here we go, policy, what is the competency that they're trying to um, uh, uh, get teachers to acquire? How long is this unit of study? What's the methodology? And then it says introduction, blah, blah, blah. And um, policy orientation. Now, uh, someone mentioned earlier, where are all these policy documents? All right, uh, we would love to see some of them so we can take some ideas. So as part of the Rwanda um, uh, policy awareness competency, they've, they've pulled out for the teachers where the individual um, uh, policy statements are where they're involved. Okay, not teachers aren't involved with everything within the policy, but where they, they are involved. So someone's going through very carefully. You can see review pages 37 to 40 and page 58. So it means that the whole document is not necessarily of interest to educators, but those passages are particularly focused on their role. Okay, and so it goes through. There's a whole load of them here. And there's opportunities for them to discuss amongst themselves using a forum. And then there's a little portfolio assignment where they have to uh, develop a presentation that identifies what the six policy documents suggest you do to implement uh, uh, them at the first at national level and then later in your own classroom. So um, it's you can see it's very definitely trying to get them to think about what is out there, be aware of what's out there, and then in this instance, even apply um, what it's asking them to do within a particular, uh, um, within their school, within their classroom. All right. Um, and yeah, there's a bit more, blah, blah, blah. Uh, there's, here's where they upload their assignment. So Vincent was saying earlier that there were facilitators, that they trained the facilitators to uh, actually support this online. Um, uh, and the, what's nice is if we look at the bottom, there's the open license, CC by SA saying, if you want, you can come take it, adapt it, 
fix it, put your own policy documents in, but you could do similar activities, etc. All right, so let's go back here. Um, now I'm going to go back and back. All right, so that was just for policy understanding. We said there were 18 resources, and you can see you can work your way through. Interestingly, the knowledge creation areas is much less resources. Okay, on the various uh, activities, and that's because most of the partners to date have focused on knowledge acquisition and knowledge deepening. They feel that there's quite a jump yet before there's a sufficient number of educators who want to operate at this level. The South Africans did it, for example, I mentioned they had a third, third, third across all of the three columns. Um, however, there's no doubting they use the first two so much more than the, the last one at the moment. So they say, yeah, every now and then we go, oh, we've got, an, we've got a cohort of teachers who are now operating at that level. Um, let's open up those units of study for them. But there are, tends to be less. Um, all right, if we scroll down, these are the characters who are at play. We heard the Moroccans talk about the Tunisian materials earlier, um, and they're all in here. You can come in and uh, have a uh, look at them if you want. Um, here they are, all the bits and pieces. Remember, I said they were nice because they were refreshing and a bit different from uh, some of the other approaches. And the Moroccans like the idea that some uh, that, that the Tunisians had, had put some thought into how they did it. All right, the uh, Guyana materials, here's the Rwanda, they're not just policy, they've got at the moment, they're 14, so there's one on curriculum and assessment and the environment and the internet and the social media and pro problem-based learning and hardware and so on and so on. Okay, there they all are. Uh, and we've had a promise from Vincent, so I'm going to chase him up now. We want their advanced ICT essentials course. All right, so that's looking good. Um, the, we've got um, the Ministry of Education in Turkey are working on this. So there's not much in here at the moment. There's a couple of little interesting bits and pieces, but their full ICT CFT program is still coming. And the South African materials I mentioned, there's 56 units in here. They went to town, all right? So they really, really, really built lots and lots and lots. And it's all for you to take and, and use. Um, we've got some stuff uh, in French uh, from the Togo materials. Uh, the University of Cambridge has two or three very, very nice um, units of study on um, uh, and very, uh, come at it a completely different way from the, the others. So it's also cool. The Egyptian one, we're going to hear from Gihan in a moment about um, their experience with putting this together. So if we go and have a look at one of theirs. It's also sitting on a Moodle server. I'm just going to turn it into Arabic so it all lines up the right way. There we go. And um, right for, <laughs> for me, I go, oh, that looks nice because I can't really understand a word Arabic. Um, but if that's your area, then yes, we've got a whole load of stuff in there. The Kenyan ones we've mentioned a few times today, the Zimbabwe ones we've mentioned, etc. Here are those generic ones. Remember we said earlier this morning, if you're interested in the generic stuff, because uh, you don't want to root out all the wrong policy documents, etc., then you can just come in here. If we look at this one, for example, this is their policy one. Uh, you'll see it is it is neutral. It's uh, it's not about a particular um, country. It's at a very high level. What's your role in terms of nation building? Um, uh, what are the general benefits of using ICT in education and for learning? Um, what are the benefits for the actual institutions involved, etc.? What are the benefits in terms of soft skills and teacher professional development? What are the ICT challenges? Because it's not all wonderful. So what are the issues? So there's a little page on that with some choice resources, an opportunity for them to discuss. Um, and then what is this ICT competency framework that's so mentioned there? And then there's a little assignment for them to do and along the same ideas about what does this mean for you as an educator? Uh, if we look at the license, there it is, CC by SA, take it, use it, adapt it, fix it, make it better. Um, it's sitting in Moodle. So if you have a Moodle server, you can just ask for the um, Moodle backup. We will give it to you. 
and then you can start from there adapting it uh, and making it the language you want and talking about uh, local issues okay so um that's all very nice so that's probably the biggest most important part of the of the uh, of the hub is that it offers you quick access to all of these rich 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 resources already developed people already thought about it you can see it's not a case of just a couple of little documents here and there it's an all integrated into a learning uh, approach uh, these ones are coming from various different countries. You can have a look there. We, we heard from Chris and Francis earlier today. Theirs will be available here soon, uh, and so on. There also is a little section on the interest groups. So you can talk uh, to the community. So the community comes in here every now and then and does some cleaning up and posting new resources, etc. And then these are very slow discussions um, about various uh, aspects of the CFT. And then there's a little toolkit of what, how do you go about this? For example, uh, what was nice about Vincent's presentation, although we didn't get to see slide 14 very clearly, but um, how do you lay it all out? And how do you, um, are there any templates to be used? So this is quite nice. This little uh, toolkit area here provides this one particularly provide you with a whole load of templates and approaches about how to actually unpack the ICT CFT and then um, uh, use these various little resources. For example, uh, we talked about canvassing your teacher community. So there's some surveys you can adapt. Uh, we talked about building a curriculum map. Zainab mentioned that right up at the beginning. Um, you should actually have a very clear idea about what you're going to cover and how you're going to cover it and so on. So there's a curriculum map template. Let's just go through to that page. You can see their PDFs, etc. All right. Um, some ideas about how to check ICT readiness. So again, some templates, etc. So, all right, you, you don't need to know all that, but basically you're seeing then that this is an extremely rich resource, this hub with lots and lots of little goodies. It's worth spending a bit of time in here, digging around and finding out what, um, uh, what would be useful in terms of, of your approach to using the ICT CFT. There's a couple of little videos here about how to use the hub. I've given you a very quick overview. If you want to have a look at it, um, let me put the link again. So uh, I wouldn't mind though that you now spend a few minutes having a look at the little tutorial on the hub. It'll take you through some of the things, but I definitely want you to go onto the hub and actually have a little dig around. So I'm going to put the links in the chat. Again, there's an English uh, tutorial. There's a French and Russian language tutorial as well. I can't give you as long this time because we are um, um, times against us. We've, we, our program got a bit bigger than we anticipated. Uh, that's a good thing, uh, but we will finish on time. Uh, is Gihan available for after that session? Is she here? Yes, I am. Yeah, there we go. All right, so we've uh, got another case study coming up. I'm going to only give you 10 minutes for the- uh, Okay, that's um, fine. No, no, sorry, for the, for the interactive tutorial, and then we're going to put you straight afterwards. So you will present in about 12 minutes time. Is that all right? All right, yep. Cool, all right. Um, uh, right, so let me put, here's the question I would like you to answer. So uh, tutorial number two coming up, you've got 10 minutes this time. Did you find anything useful on the hub? So whatever happens, I want you to make sure that you drill through to the hub and that you have a dig around. I quickly showed you a couple of little items here and there, which take my fancy, but what did you find? Okay, so the link for the hub is already in the chat. And here comes the tutorials. If you'd like to use the tutorials as your way to go through the step-by-step. All right, on the screen at the moment is the second um, tutorial. It's about the hub and the network. And I'd like you, this is shorter than the other one anyway. You've now got nine minutes and 40 seconds. Can you work your way through this? But whatever happens, you've got to get to the hub itself and have a dig around. Andrew, thanks. It's very useful. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, I already submitted the item to the reply in English uh, 
just to make your just to save your time <laughs> but yeah, of course, uh, yeah. Uh, does OER hub uh, consist any point in different language apart English French and Arabic because uh, uh, you know so the framework does the frameworks in about nine or ten different languages but mm -hmm. the hub is only in three in English so okay. uh, it's partly because the people who put it together, the team who actually developed it in the early days were all English speaking. They, they came from many different countries, but they could all work you together. See, you see the, the limitations is, is there because uh, I show this hub many times to participants in, in Central Asia and they told, oh, this is everything in English or in French. Okay, we don't care. And uh, it's reason why, you know, if we have entry point in Russian language, uh, uh, just you know, translate the first page, for instance, uh, how to or something like uh, really entry. Uh, it will uh, encourage interest of the readers, and of course, uh, everybody like uh, to use their language. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's why uh, I was very excited earlier when I heard one of the speakers saying that they've got a whole program, and I'm just hoping they're all OERs and that we can load them into. Uh, the hub and give it an even wider uh, context. At the moment, there's only French, Portuguese, Arabic, mm -hmm. and English uh, mm -hmm. as resources. But we're constantly looking for more opportunities. UNESCO has moved away from supporting um, uh, English, well, not moved away, but there's less emphasis on English speaking ICT CFT projects. And now they're trying to encourage other languages. So there's and um, Senegal, um, Ivory Coast, uh, Turkey, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. So they are desperately now trying to source resources in other languages. Okay, just just to work around, maybe we, we can think on uh, how to start in English, the page of the country. But is it everything is here? Uh, start from the scratch. I mean. The old tools is there. You don't need to consult headquarters. You don't need to discuss with anyone because everything is, is there, all explanations, and you need just you know the awesome. patient and also time to understand how it works, and then you can start from the scratch. Sounds good. The the yeah, it's that. Uh, the, English has got such a stranglehold on the internet generally anyway so yeah. uh, you're right we need to find ways to make it more accessible to people in other languages which, which country was our, uh, they no, I say? like I like Turkey case because they start from from English and uh, the flag is there and for instance if we have a Kyrgyzstan already implemented number of activities we can ask uh, uh, just to make the, just to create something and uh, you know because they already adopted and they have a number of resources in local languages, including Kyrgyz. Uh, Kazakhs maybe not yet started, but uh, they also are underway. Um, uh, and uh, the policies is the most important because for instance, uh, they have a digital policies and uh, uh, the countries in Central Asian region is quite uh, advanced in, in, for, in some specific areas like economics, uh, banking business, etc. Et uh, digital the, from the in the digi digital form, because it's a country priorities. But from other side, uh, the educational uh, and also Wikipedia. Uh, Kazakhstan is champion in, in wiki in Wikimedia Wikipedia. Uh, uh, I mean, but these resources not yet available for general public because of the language. Okay, but uh, if the English is a way to start, it's Again, it's not a problem. Uh, maybe Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan could start from the uh, from English, uh, through English, and, uh, and do something. Our, our experience was there was like a hesitancy for the first time. So when we uh, went for the French one in Djibouti, for example, uh, there was a hesitancy at first, but as soon as there was one French one, then Togo was keen, and then other people were keen, etc. And the same with the Arabic as well. We struggled to get our first Arabic one up, but then they started to start fl flowing. So I think, yes, we need to just get that initial inertia over, um, so Turkish or uh, 
uh, these other uh, other languages and then then it begins to flow so once you got one thing in the pot absolutely absolutely thank you thank you cool all right guys our clock has run down i'm afraid well, that this afternoon we're under a little bit of pressure I, there's no way you had enough time to do the tutorial properly but i'm hoping you did spend a little bit of time in the hub because in the end that's where the meat is all right so i'm going to have a very quick look at some of your comments in the in the form uh, yes i found the policies part and specific subjective uh, subject resources. I'm not clear how to start adaptation and translation. More time needed to investigate and understand starting points. For instance, can specific countries create their own resource from scratch by using an example? All right, so the answer is yes. These are OERs, so you can use them any way that you want. And if you just want to use them as inspiration, well, that's fine too. All right, so if you say, all right, I just like the idea of this activity, but I would approach it completely differently and I would use completely different case studies. And uh, my, uh, what I anticipate teachers doing is completely different from what they've asked them to do here. But I, 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 I like what they're asking them to do. So then, yes. So if you feel you just want to be inspired by some of them, and that's all you want to do, that's cool. You probably don't even have to attribute them. If you know your Creative Commons licenses, you're supposed to acknowledge. Um, but in that case, it's, it's rather tenuous link. Um, but as soon as you start using bits and pieces of it, then yes, you should have that in your attribution. And that's nice. That's good. It's just sharing the love. All right. So uh, yeah, uh, I found the policies part. Uh, and the specific subject resources, that section on curriculum, for example, is very often contextually bound. So, for example, the South African syllabus curriculum is no, is very, even though they might cover very generic topics, the way it's laid out and where the emphasis lies and so on and so on is all very different. So normally those, especially the policy one and especially the curriculum one, normally have to be built up from the ground. Some of the others on things like uh, internet safety, for example, um, it can be can be generic um, because um, when you're online, it is an international environment anyway. So maybe there, there's less adaptation that you have to do. That's another kettle of fish: is how do you adapt these resources? Um, I can give you some links to um, these little tutorials on how to adapt to OER, um, but that's not on today's program. All right, so yes, I'll be honest. To be able to create something from scratch obviously is a creative decision, but to be able to adapt something is also a creative skill. And I often feel those people don't get enough recognition to be able to bend something so that it works beautifully or perfectly for your context. That takes a bit of skill. Yeah. Okay, all right, that's enough of that. What we're going to do next is we're going to hand over to Gian. She's going to uh, give us the Egyptian experience. Um, she's going to tell us a little bit how, uh, how they found their resources that they wanted to adapt and what specific challenges there was in this adaptation process. Obviously, it's for a North African environment and for a different language. So let's have a listen to what she has to say, and then we can discuss that further. So, um, so hello everyone, uh, very exciting to be with you all as you explore this uh, rich possibility. Um, we started uh, thinking about um, um, using the ICT CFT when uh, in 2016 when we were at uh, an Arab meeting uh, introducing us to OER, uh, it was in uh, Amman, Jordan. And uh, we were so fascinated by, um, and um, at, on that day, we listened to the Kenyan experience. And uh, we were fascinated by uh, their whole experience adapting uh, the ICTFT and adapting materials from other resources and using that uh, for their teacher uh, professional development. Uh, Egypt is another um, very large uh, educational system. Uh, in K-12 and public schools, we have more than a million teachers. 
and uh, definitely um, um, like um, give, providing them with professional development um, always uh, needs a lot of work and a lot of resources. So uh, we were sitting on this table trying to think of a project to do related to OER. And um, we all thought like um, there were, um, there was uh, Sudan, uh, Tunisia and, um, and Egypt and, um, and Syria. And we decided, well, why don't we adopt this great uh, adapt this great resource uh, to Arabic. There is nothing like this that exists in Arabic that is open and adaptable uh, and contextualized. And so the, the original idea was that uh, the four countries collaborate together to produce this content in Arabic. Um, and um, well, uh, Syria fell uh, away pretty soon. And after that, uh, Tunisia and uh, and um, and um, Sudan also uh, decided not to participate. It was for personal reason. One person was going for their PhD, and another person was going for a um, high-paying job somewhere, and they were not. They couldn't make the commitment anymore. So anyway, so we decided to go ahead. Um, at that time, I worked at the American University in Cairo, which is a private university. But um, um, the graduate student, uh, the graduate school of education at that time um, uh, provided um, many professional development activities um, in English to public and private school teachers. And um, one um, issue we often had is that uh, many public school teachers could not um, take our um, professional development activities or participate in them because they required a certain level of English. And so um, we decided to do something that is very unconventional for our university, which is to um, offer um, offer a course in Arabic. And so, so that is how we all started. So when we first uh, began, we had several aims. We first wanted to have a thorough look at the Kenyan course that was available for us to adapt and then contextualize it uh, and localize it because there are definitely differences, although there are commonalities, uh, but uh, we had to uh, localize it to fit uh, the needs and unique uh, context of our um, public school teachers in Egypt. Um, and uh, of course, that was uh, quite challenging in a number of ways. Um, it, was, it was challenging finding um, local uh, resources uh, that are open and uh, are not centralized um, so that was difficult. It was also very difficult to find resources in Arabic. And uh, so, um, so we really had to sometimes um, adapt uh, resources that are there. And at times we had to create our own resources. Um, could, we, could we move forward with the slides, please? So, um, so we reviewed the Kenyan one, we Arabized it and adapted it to the local context. And of course, um, when, uh, when um, Sudan and uh, Tunisia um, were no longer part of the project, it was just Egypt and um, we localized it to our particular needs. Um, and then uh, we implemented uh, the course and um, and uh, evaluated what went right and wrong. I'll go through the details now, uh, although I will uh, quickly go through them because I don't. I'm not given much time because we have such a rich day today. Anyway, so uh, moving forward, so we started with you know kind of assessing what uh, our teachers knew about open educational resources and ICCFT, and, and that was pretty minimal. Most of them had not heard of open educational resources. That was in 2018, of course, before Corona, when online 
uh, learning and teaching was really something that uh, was quite rare in Egypt. Uh, things have definitely changed uh, since then. So we kind of assessed where things were and we decided to target the, the basic level, which is the acquisition of knowledge about uh, technologies. Um, and uh, we, we focused on that one. Uh, and we tried to localize it in the sense that um, um, we try to address the, the, uh, the problem of funding that teachers often face in the public system. And so we depended entirely on tools and content that was, was open and free uh, and uh, sustainable. Uh, and so we, that was one of our main uh, foci um, for that course so that it becomes accessible to everybody. So this was our pilot group. And it started with a workshop about OER and a workshop about understanding what were the variables that prevented teachers from integrating technology uh, in their classrooms. And uh, that workshop was attended by other colleagues who had worked on projects of open educational resources um, uh, with UNESCO and uh, members of uh, the Ministry of Education in Egypt. Um, so we had, you know, experts from Greece and Lebanon and Jordan um, in that picture. So, so we had this, uh, this session, as I said, about raising awareness and giving teachers voice, which is something that is usually very rare in our context and providing hands-on training, not the normal lecturing at them, but them doing things on their own, and the idea of building community and opening up discussion. So uh, this was the workshop we had that day. Of course, the facilities here look quite nice because it took place in, a, in AUC, the American University in Cairo, which is a private university. Facilities in other areas don't uh, look like that. But this is the room we had. And, uh, and so we had quite a good, you know, representative group like um, males to females, um, you know, more experience, less experience, uh, and so forth. And, uh, and so during that time, we covered the basics of OER. Next, please. And uh, student, uh, teachers were really enthusiastic. Uh, they created on their own a group in WhatsApp that is working till today. I get we interact uh, on that group. Uh, they expressed interest in more advanced workshops. And they also wanted to become advocates and trainers uh, to other teachers. And um, this is um, the course we created in Arabic that very much mirrored um, the Kenyan course in structure, uh, although some of the content definitely was very different. Um, and um, uh, after 15 weeks of training uh, that was blended in format where they um, would come every three weeks to the campus and the other two weeks would be online teachers uh, finally graduated. Uh, one of the funny things we encountered was that they were so surprised that um, they had to be so active during the training and uh, submit so many, uh, so much content and on time and all that. And they, they were really surprised about that. So their graduation day was pretty special for us and for them. Um, we loved, of course, that this enabled teachers who otherwise would not participate because of the language barrier or the geographic barrier. We had teachers come from, you know, governorates that were six hours away. So, um, so that was um, really um, inspiring to us and motivating. Uh, this was, uh, for example, a young teacher who uh, would come uh, would uh, take the bus six hours to Cairo and back uh, just because uh, she wanted to participate uh, in that um, uh, course. 
professional development. Next, please. So some of the challenges we had, of course, as I mentioned before, finding um, materials or content online uh, that was that, you know, was more cutting edge that talked about modern issues related to education and technology. You can find a lot of uh, more traditional historic stuff, but cutting edge technology issues was, was more of a problem, especially for teachers. And uh, finding contextualized materials, we, we really had a problem finding materials on policy and strategy within the educational realm in Arabic uh, that fit our context. That was almost impossible to find. And other challenges we had, uh, we had a problem just uh, like uh, find like um, convincing people that we are offering this content as open content. Um, and the idea that this was a professional development course where our conversations were private, but the content is open for anyone to access and take. This required a lot of discussion. Somehow people could not conceive of this idea of openness at all. Um, and so this took a lot of time until we technically could do that, but not because it was such a problem, but because it was unheard of at that time within our institution. Uh, another problem was, this was a UNESCO grant, uh, a grant with the, um, the UNESCO office in Cairo, um, a, a small grant, but it helped us a lot uh, because finding uh, funding such uh, fun, funding this uh, fun, finding money to um, to um, uh, pay for the time of people who took part in in the project was extremely difficult. So the UNESCO grant definitely helped. Um, it was difficult for us to um, convince people that um, our teachers and faculty would engage in something that is open for everyone to have and uh, nothing that was uh, you know a business de decision that is for profit and finally it was very difficult to sustain it just for a number of reasons uh, one of them of course was the funding and or at least acknowledging that this is an effort that uh, is worthy or that would count towards the responsibilities the other problem was um, connecting to the Ministry of Education and finding a way to integrate that within their professional development opportunities. This was uh, a major challenge and impacted uh, sustainability. So, so both of these issues were a problem to sustain, um, to sustain offering the course. Um, but, uh, the one thing we were able to do was uh, that we were able to integrate um, the Egyptian ICT CFT course into the hub and um, our, that is the only sustainability thing that we managed uh, to do uh, and now we're trying to find new ways of um, um, like um, sustaining providing these courses especially that we found them to be uh, really useful for our teachers but uh, the level of effort it requires can cannot be sustained with our current resources um, i think that's all uh, thank you very much for being here for listening and uh, of course if you have any question i'd be more than happy to answer them Thanks. So uh, as a comment uh, there about sustainability there, and you might have heard me chatting while, we, while you were investigating the hub. The first jump is often the most resource intensive. And as Gihan has pointed out, there just weren't any Arab language resources which keyed nicely with their requirements in terms of OER. And we've heard um, there's a similar problem with Russian and other languages as well. So um, the OERs can only take you so far. There comes a point when you need to be a contributor and, and, and um, put it out there. The fact that we now do have 
and Arab language. The Egyptian one was the first one, and then Alexo and the Tunisian one came along uh, later. Uh, kind of gets the ball rolling. Now there's two pots to choose from. And so anyone putting together an Arabic uh, course uh, has more options and therefore has to produce less of their own content. So keep that in mind. That is a problem. That is a big problem. And so I'm making a plea at the moment that anyone who has now created um, some ICT CFT inspired materials, ideally in another language other than English, French, well, English. <laughs> we'll have we'll take anything and everything to be honest, uh, and then we can put it in the hub. So either alert me that you've now got these OERs, which we can put in the hub, um, uh, or you can put it in yourself. Um, we, it's a community, and we encourage um, you guys to get involved. But I'll be very keen to help you in any way you can put those OERs into the hub, so that other ICT CFT projects can benefit. All right, that sustainability issue is a problem on that first that first round. Okay, we, and you can just see how many times the Kenyan materials have been used because they were the first ones to really dig deep and and put something up in English anyway. All right, uh, Gihan, thank you very much. Are there any questions or queries for Gihan? And is Vincent still here or is he gone? All right, are they, so rather than another breakout session, because we're just running out of time, I've, got, I've only got eight minutes before I hand over to Zainab again. Are there any queries or questions um, for the, about any aspect that you've heard this afternoon? All right, then I'm going to, uh, you still can, I'm just going to fill the time because we've got a few minutes before I ask Zainab to uh, um, address us again about how to go forward. We've spent considerable time this morning looking at the framework and explaining how it works and the theory behind it and um, how you unpack it. And then this after, after lunch, we spent some time at the hub and we looked at the different types of resources in there. We talked about some of the pros and the cons. We've listened to three different um, case studies about how different countries have tackled the problem. Um, and you might remember in my previous slide, I said that the there was, um, let me click on it so I get it. I said that there were three components to the UNESCO ICT-CFD plan, all right? The framework, the resources, but also this network, all right? So what is this network? So um, basically, uh, if you look at the little picture there, that was taken in Rwanda uh, a couple of years ago now when we had a little meeting there of uh, all the practitioners that we could dig up at the time and uh, try and form um, a, a, a little group of experts, people who've, who've played this role before. Um, at the time, we put together a little WhatsApp group and both amazingly and flatteringly, is there such a word, flatteringly, um, it's been a very active group and they constantly share resources and talk to each other and then encourage new people, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So th this little group um, is passionate about what they do. Um, they've got great experience. They're from all around the world. They've tackled the ICT, CFT, and the OERs in completely different ways. So there's all different perspectives on how to do something, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the third rich component to the ICT, CFT initiatives. You really do have access to this little group of passionate, experienced ICT CFT co uh, coordinators. So um, if you are involved and in an ICT CFT project and you'd like to tap into this expertise, again, talk to Zainab or myself or someone who will get you into the group and then um, you can either talk to them generally or uh, peel off when you found someone who is uh, tackles the ICT CFT the same way as you. So that is the third component, the little network. And um, it's, yeah, you, if you're gonna go this route, you might as well take this, this other piece. It's a very rewarding, very insightful um, and very interesting little group. So yeah, keep that in mind. There is a community of experienced practitioners, it says on the screen. All right. Okay, so which brings me then um, to the end of the of the, the general um, 
explanation as to what the ICT CFT initiatives are all about. Um, and I just want to summarize then, keep in mind, we've got this framework 2018. Hopefully now you've got a copy that you downloaded this morning. Um, it's available in lots of languages. It's a very good starting point. It's a very good framework, okay? It's not mandatory in any way, and it gives you plenty, plenty of ideas about how to go forward. Then we have this resource hub, chock a block of really quality, um, detailed um, resources that you can uh, either take and just tweak or rework completely because of their open licenses. And then the third piece is the little network of champions, a network of experienced practitioners. So keep that in mind then, that is, that is the, what's on offer. Um, you might notice that a few of the presenters mentioned me. All right, so um, the, I'm part of that group as well. So if you also want to tap into some of my experience, I've been extremely fortunate that I've worked from Guyana. The reason why all those countries are in there is because I personally got involved somehow with most of them. So I knew about what they were up to and so on. So I also am very keen to help new countries, um, uh, new institutions uh, get up and running with an ICT CFT project. However, um, you don't have to. You don't have to use me at all. The South Africans kind of got on with it. Um, I popped in from time to time, but they just about did it themselves. They didn't, uh, you saw Gihan there, she, she talked to me once or twice, but basically um, they just got on with it. So you don't have to use all these goodies, but it just seems um, that it is a resource that you can use if you want. All right. Okay, I'm gonna hand over to Zainab, is she here? Um, can you tell us uh, what, what are the opportunities that uh, comes under the UNESCO umbrella? Well, um, the opportunities that come under the UNESCO umbrella. First of all, thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much for your incredible presentation and all the uh, overview and the richness of what you've, uh, what you've uh, presented to the colleagues. And thank you to, to our colleagues from Nigeria, Dr. Francis, Chris, and of course, thank you to Vincent also for uh, connecting. I think it was not that easy to get on for him. And I thank you very much for that and your very rich presentation. And uh, also thank you to Jihan for your presentation, which showed how this uh, was being done in another region and another, um, and uh, the, the experience that was uh, from developing it in Arabic in Egypt. Um, what are the next steps? Well, we can support you if you're interested in contextual in developing contextualized materials, taking this one step for, further, working on the contextualization of the CFT, development of the OER materials, and even support uh, pilot pilot training. We are here, um, and our colleagues in this field are here also. Um, I speak for you. I hope it's okay, Sergey, and um, and Elena, and of course. Paul and uh, Ming, if you're here, and we're we're here, uh, and we'd very much like to work with you and support you in any going further in this uh, in this process. The materials are there. You're welcome to go to them there and see what is useful for you. You can use them, of course, without having ever speaking to any of us. But what we would really like is if you could share what you do, because it is the objective of this work is really knowledge sharing and creating what um, Mr. Jalassi, DGCI said this morning, creating inclusive knowledge societies. The purpose of our work is in order to share knowledge and to create knowledge together. And uh, so that is why we would really like to work with you and be able to, um, to build something uh, that is actually exponential which is what it becomes when we all work together. Um, the, the, the next steps are, if you are interested, please get in touch with us and we'll see how we can work uh, with you on the different steps on a more individual level or national level with me, with my colleagues as you like, but uh, in any which way, I'll put in the, the chat, the, um, the, 
the name, uh, that my email and that of, uh, well, you can put my email if you know my colleagues, so please do reach out to them and we will we'd very much like to move forward with you. Um, we have this expert network and we'd be welcome you to join it. I put in two links in the emails in the chat. The first link was for, um, I have, actually I put in one link. The first link was for the um, OER Dynamic Coalition. And this is something else. This is a group of people that are working on open educational resources in print in general. So it includes those that are working on this project and also those that are working on different aspects of open educational resources. It's part of the OER recommendation implementation strategy. And it brings together about uh, 250 people right now from over 70 countries uh, at different levels of uh, institutional, national, civil society. And you're very much welcome to join it. And you'll see that we have a, a lot of activities going on. So you can learn more about the open educational resources discussions that we've had, because they link directly to another larger program, which is on the implementation of the OER recommendation, which was adopted in 2019. Secondly, uh, we have this network that isn't WhatsApp group, so it's based on telephone numbers. So if you're interested in being part of this, let me know and we'll see how we can uh, get you on. Um, we, and this is just a network of people who are working on the project already and they share information on when there is different workshops and different activities and they also uh, this group has helped so that, in fact, it's not really just from the center to the different parts, but the different uh, colleagues on this group actually work together in their different national contexts. For example, in this meeting, we actually have Dr. Ilyas Ahmed, who is the um, responsible uh, officer, or he's the, he's the lead of the work being done in Djibouti. We also have Dr. Hussein Koja Sarec, who's the uh, responsible uh, lead in the uh, Turkish, uh, Turkish hub. We have, um, you saw, you met with, uh, you heard from uh, our colleague, um, you heard from our colleague, uh, Jihan, um, who spoke earlier, Vincent, who spoke earlier, of course, Chris. Uh, there's Fauzi who put his camera on just now. He is the OER chair for, um, for OER in Lebanon, who's also a very uh, important colleague. Chris, you just put your camera on, you're in a car, I see, okay. And so uh, this is just to let you know, there are some, there are a lot of great colleagues out there with a lot of experience and uh, the, the network is very collegial and people are sharing information on what they're doing and they're also sharing information on the different activities and the workshops, there is a lot of things going on in this area. And um, you will excuse me, I've spoken English the whole time, almost, but it's because I'm a little bit overwhelmed. It's the end of the year, but the work is done in English, French, Turkish, on uh, Arab, in Arabic. It's a multilingual effort. And as uh, Sergei said, the work should be done in other languages because we all know there are many, many languages on our planet and we need to work more in Russian, in Arabic, in French and in other languages. So this is definitely the objective for next year. We hope to increase the both the size and the diversity of the network, because this is what lends it strength. I'd like to thank Andrew sincerely for his incredible expertise in making these um, these works this workshop possible, as well as the one that we had that was similar a week ago in Arabic and English. Um, Andrew is the guardian angel of this process and his, and it's his, um, it's his intelligence and his stamina and his belief in this that has come up with these wonderful ideas of how we can share this information, the online tutorial and the, um, and the, the discussions we've had 
were co co conceptualized by Anna, uh, by Andrew, and it's uh, really it's uh, we're very lucky that uh, he's able to work with us on this project. So I uh, thank you very much, and I hope sincerely that you all have a wonderful break of some sort, and that we will be able to work together in the coming year. We're here and we look forward to collaborating with you. And um, there is an evaluation, maybe Andrew, you, you can explain the link is in the document, I'm sorry. It, the link is in the, in the chat from Andrew. If you could leave us your, your feedback, this would be very useful because we want to continue this. COVID has happened. We're not going back to what we had before, but as again, Rady G said, we have to build back we build back better, we build forward. And this is part of building back better, building forward. We have these devices at our disposition. Let us continue our work any which way we can. And we very much look forward to work, uh, seeing you and working with you in the future. Thank you. Oh, excuse me. I have to add, uh, thank uh, behind the scenes, the persons that have really been making all of this possible are I said to and I said to double and Eleni Bursino there is it I said to and Eleni you've been in contact with these people they've been writing to you they've been contacting you they have made sure that everything actually happened and they've been working behind the scenes to make sure that it continues to happen and that everything doesn't fall apart in mid-flight and I would like to sincerely thank them. They are invaluable members of our team and they make the wheels keep rolling. So thank you so much, Vicente, thank you. And also on this call, we have um, Cedric Ruckholz. Cedric, are you there? Uh, perhaps he's been calling. Cedric is, uh, is the chief of section in, in the uh, section for digital transformation. And uh, he has been supporting this work. And for this, we are very, very thankful. We have Sergey, who's online and who's, uh, who's uh, on the photo. Sergey is our colleague in, uh, in Almaty. And Elena, who's joined us from the middle of the night in Havana. So you see people, that we, there are a lot of colleagues. There's a huge team behind everything. So we hope very much that we'll be able to work together. So thanks.